Ryan's mom's coming in. Oh. Wow. <laughs> All right. Oh, so nice. He's living here for like the next four days. I figured, oh. All right, Christopher, you're cut off. Good evening, everyone. The highlights of the new traffic accident. The Beaver County man is being held for murder. It's more labor. What's going on, y'all? You're tuning in to the highest rated, most listened to podcast to ever grace the airwaves, and you're a better person for listening to us. <laughs> All right, maybe not, but you're really going to enjoy it anyways. This is Made to Motivate Podcast, and we'll be talking social media hot topics, pop culture news, the greatest in movies and music, and all things sports. Make sure you're following us on social media, at Made to Motivate Podcast, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can watch the show on our YouTube. Thanks for tuning in, and with that being said, let's get this show started. What is going on, y'all? Made to Motivate podcast, season eight, episode eight. This is your host, Ryan Weiss. And I am joined, as always, by Christopher, the film freak, Kessinger. Squishy. Squishy a peanut. How many beers did you have? <laughs> Just one? That's What's up, dude? Fucking guy. Daniel, the shoe guy, Sandman. I, I don't even know how to follow Squishy Peanut. It's a squishy a peanut. You can have a pickled I- dick. Pickled dicks. Pickled dick. <laughs> Good job, I'm going to refrain from having used the podcast disclaimer, and we're just going to go right past that. Oh, Dude, who's down to get some dicks this weekend? <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> Anyhow, and we also got a special guest, a returning guest. I think our first returning yep. guest, yep. Uh, Norm Carrero, is also in uh, studio with us today. So he's going to be uh, hanging out for the whole show, but also our Made to Motivate uh, segment. We're going to be doing a throwback to three years ago. God. Has it been three years, really? Yeah. Three years. Three years. Yeah, we were crazy. We were right in the infancy of COVID, like the COVID age. Wild. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to go back to season three um, and do a follow up with Norm's story and all of our other segments. But first off, Weekly Rewind. Christopher, what's new? What's happening? God, this has been the week from hell. Man, yeah. I mean, these three days of work are enough to make me want to just retire at the age of 38 and never go back in again. I'm sure you get like 1% of away. your retirement benefits when you're 38, right? Like yeah. 1%? No. No. No? You're going to get nothing. Jesus. You well, live off your mom. Great. Well, 27 years to go. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, now, besides that, um, I don't know, man. It's been a chill week because like last week was every other day was a movie. Um, so it's kind of nice this week. I do have Shazam coming up tomorrow um and then a an art house uh break-in movie starring uh willem fickner on uh or, or willem defoe sorry yeah. on saturday uh inside interesting so defoe is back defoe is back I saw him on, like jimmy kimmel or something and he looked wild yeah that dude why has he never been the joker seriously i've been saying this for a decade they talked about it on the jimmy kimmel episode really about him being uh him he actually said he pitched the idea he tried to pitch the idea of being not the joker but being like a Joker nemesis where like he tries to steal the Joker's thunder and like ploy on him. Out kind Joker of him. Yeah. Mm, yeah I'm he tried that. pitching that idea. He said it didn't really go anywhere, but mm. so I like to foe. He's he looked he looked wild though. He he just has that weird fucking face. Yeah. He does. And he had a big, big old beard and crazy hair and he's great in Lighthouse, though. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna know. Daniel. Hello. What's new? What's happening? Oh, uh, you know, nothing. Lies. I know you did something yeah. yesterday. What did I do yesterday? Call your wife right now. Uh, all right. So we got the invitations out for the wedding. I got mine today. I got mine today got too. Oh, I didn't get mine. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even open mine. I'm like, I'm I put sorry, this fucking sticker on this thing. I'm not opening this. Alicia shit. says hi. Awkward. No, she didn't. She didn't say. Hi. <laughs> she did. She'll she'll message you and tell us. I tell didn't even get thing. an invite to the bachelor party. We're going to be at Boundary. We're going to high voltage go karts. Yes. I don't like you, Norm. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can't invite my my opponents to the from mini golf league. Well, Chris, you, you Chris, can't. It's new for Chris, for me. He's new to the league for me. There's like five. Ryan's, I, I can't really call him an opponent. Wow. There's like five people in the league I can't challenge because. It would, you know, ruin the show, ruin whatever. <laughs> so I kind of no, have see, to go around them. When it, when it comes to, you know, limited people, 
I have a big. You're lucky family. I don't like to leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to show up and crash it, more than welcome to. We, we were actually going to have it at your house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> damn it! On the spot. Yeah. Norm spot. calling me out. I got. I actually got a lot of friends that are going to be very upset. You don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> First thing wrong with who that invited state? this guy? <laughs> yeah, these two weren't on the show together. I know the last we time Norm was here. So was it just it was Jesse? No, it was like who? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> um, stuff the envelopes. Norm, yours is in the mail. It might get lost. Uh, he ran into stamps. <laughs> ran out of stamps. Let's see, I was trying to go through that registry uh, addresses. Yesterday we had an event. Ryan actually drank last night. Can you believe I that? Did it was good. What did he have? Uh, I mean, probably the girliest, fruitiest thing you can Pineapple have. upside down cake. Tastes oh. fucking good. It's pretty good, though. <laughs> um, Are you not a big drinker, Ryan? I ha- I haven't, like, drank, like, consistently drank in eight years. I mean, I'll have a drink, like a wedding or, like, a very rare occasion. Mexican, I do, like, a margarita here and there. But outside of that, I mean, I probably drink maybe five times a year, if that. It was weird, because last night, like, they were so good. We're not all drinkers. They give you each person gets two drink tickets, right? Part of the admission yeah, to try. And I don't know if there's a sign or something pointing to us saying, Hey, give these guys your free drink tickets. Oh. Because as people were leaving, they would slide their tickets on our table, say, Here you go, here's some more drinks. Jeez, I think I had what, like four or five drinks. Yeah. If we wanted to get like a lit at the we could freaking, have. like wedding hall easily. Absolutely. They were just pass and drink tickets off to us i'm like we didn't get a chance to try any cake oh why i wanted to try more than the cake Uh, oh yeah they're out they're out i wanted to try the cake ladies oh cake pictures i don't have any damn light i don't i don't have any thanks i just like out for your single friends following them around like Mm -hmm. they're like oh we gotta go talk to the cake lady and make an appointment i'm like oh i'll come hang out just stood there i'm like and then and yeah cake the 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 one girl asks what are you getting into tonight? <laughs> and I said, I get myself in enough trouble. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, <laughs> uh, it was funny. Dude, I was like, uh <laughs> yeah. And he was he was standing like five feet away off to the right, just staring at everybody. Yeah. And she she caught him a couple times. She she, she definitely I got I got busted tracking wow. beam. Jeez, it was but bad. You look like fun. a perfect fit in between mm. got my recall done on the car and the, the oil change so we're good it's nice. passed with flying colors at the usually like so sarah will send you a video yeah of your car and all that like what the things they checked and what needs updated um and they it was like 15 seconds everything checks out good your your brakes are good your tires are wearing exactly the same all the way around your did flying you, colors did there you tell was... them i drive it once a month and that's why why right it's a weird stain in the back seat. <laughs> oh, Alicia's was like three minutes long. You need new tires. You need new brakes. Oh, yeah. brakes are good. Yeah. Your bet. Uh, Christopher is in rare form today. Seconds. <laughs> like I said, 15 seconds. Oh, uh, fuck. But is there anything else? I don't know. I think that's it. It worked. You seemed busy and got wedding stuff done. I mean, work. we had like the wedding invitation party. That was this weekend, but stuffed them. It's yeah. just nice to finally nail down the bachelor party yeah. events, you know? Yeah. 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 Jesus. If anybody wants to come crash the bachelor party, we're going to be at High Voltage Go Kart and the Foundry someday in May. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Be there. Norm, you can come. Oh, I'll probably show up. Yeah, you can come hang out. We got a hotel hotel afterwards. Just, we, oh, we can toss you guys are going to be here today. <laughs> we, we can toss you around in the. Cornhole tournaments. <laughs> Toss me around. <laughs> Jesus. Fuck you guys. <laughs> Unreal. Norman, what did you do fun and exciting this weekend? Anything fun? Anything fun this past week? Uh no. Anything fun since the last time you're on the show? Three years. We'll talk Three about years. that here in a little oh, bit. Yeah, that's a uh Twinsies. Well, you we can't see it. Oh, that's cute. Oh, I thought you were just showing me your tits again. Me too. I was like, what is going on over here? Like, oh, I've already seen those double D's, buddy. Hey. <laughs> Plenty of times. That was before I was a stage girl. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> no, my my day is usually the same. It's very routine. 
uh, wake up. I eat at eight o'clock. I eat at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, two o'clock, five o'clock, seven o'clock. I go to the gym at four. Jeez. I'm actually down to one time a day, which is, which is nice. Cause I have several injuries to my arms and my shoulders. So. Chick- chicken breast and rice. Is that what you eat? <laughs> chicken and broccoli. Nice. Yeah. Close. Um, no, actually, uh, I mean, chicken and, and ground beef is usually the, uh, the go-to meats there, but uh riced cauliflower but i can't just eat that shit like oh it's so it's so gross i gotta mix it in dude rice cauliflower is so awful i don't think i've had it it's awful i can't do i like cauliflower you gotta mix it and you gotta put other like barbecue sauce hot sauce soy sauce (laughs) i'm into it you're gonna put a lot of shit in there too it's uh, real sour is it's bad it smells even worse yeah but uh no it's it's a very routine way of eating um because i spent Oh man, my regain after the fight was like 25, 30 pounds. Oh, really? It was terrible. Yeah. Just shot right up. Yeah. Damn. I mean, because obviously most of it's water. Yeah. When you put on, when you regain that much that fast, uh, your body lets you know. And I had so much inflammation in my joints mm-hmm. from it. And yeah. So it, it took me a little bit. People don't realize you train so hard for these fights. And it's like, you know, your body does go through a transformation in just a such, such a short window. Right. I mean, I had. Uh, uh, tendonitis in both of my elbows. Wow. Uh, training for the last my last two fights, just the sheer volume of uh, punches thrown and and doing heavy bag work alone, just you know throwing left and right hooks and the impact on a heavy bag that it has in your arms is it's insane. It sounds miserable. It is Why now. That? It's now miserable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Oh. I hung out with Dan and did wedding invitations and got drunk at the wedding venue and looked at some cake. Did you, get hung, really it. did you get hung over? I actually did not. I don't know if the drinks were very strong, but I mean, they tasted great. Did not get hung over. Tried some food. The food was good. Nice. Uh, and that was really it. We're leaving for vacation tomorrow. Yeah. Cannot Flo- wait. Ida. Yeah, we're going to Florida, so be peacing out. I'll get this up before I leave. Besides Disney, this. what are you doing? No Disney. No, no Disney this time. We're going to visit some friends in Tampa, and then we're going to go visit Ashley's mom in Englewood, go mm. to the beach. Just Always up to no good. Chill vacation. Disney soon, hopefully. Not this trip, though. Mm. It's a rarity going to Florida to not go to Disney. but yeah, Couldn't go without your man over here. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe later this year. Uh, with that being said, we'll kick off the actual show. We're going to start with locker room talk. Our most favoritest of episodes or segments or whatever you want to call it. Knock that out and then we'll see when we want to do made to motivate at some point later on. Maybe. If we have time. This is Locker Room Talk. Locker Room Talk. Per usual, we just need to rename it like Football Talk because that's all we really care about Mm -hmm. or talk about. And this episode is no different. We've got Aaron Rodgers news. We've got Baker Mayfield news. We've got some Zeke news. I don't know his real name, so I'm I'm just going to go by Zeke. Zeke Elliott. Zeke Elliott. Um, But yeah, first things is uh, Baker Mayfield. This dude just getting passed around like crazy. Browns. Rams, Rams, Panthers. Oh, yeah. Panthers was first. Now he's going to follow in the goat's footsteps and officially took a trade to the Buccaneers. Yep. One year. Wasn't that what he had supposedly with the Rams? Was it one year? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's not a trade. It's a it's a free agent pickup. Like like he was an agent, free agent. Yeah. They signed his contract. Yep. So Baker's going Baker's going to the Bucks. Uh, We'll see if he has any. Is he going to be starting? Is he did they draft him as a starter? Well, with that, I mean, he could start theoretically. I think at least he'll compete for the job. Um, but they're talking about also drafting a, a quarterback too. So, like, I mean, any anything can really yeah, happen. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of like the Steelers. They picked up whatever Pickett and then just kind of threw everyone out there. So. I I still I don't know, man. I still don't think Pickett's the guy for that job in in Pittsburgh. Like, yeah. I think they have a nice core there, but I think he's gonna be gone within three years. Yeah, I I don't think he's the replacement by any means. We'll see. But, I mean, what do you guys think about Baker going to Buccaneers? Uh, do you think he has any luck there? No. Nope. Do they have enough surrounding him to 
be successful? Dan's an immediate no. Once, about once he left the Browns, he's not worth anything. Yeah. I mean, at this point, he his his a legacy or name means nothing at this point. When you've been to three teams in less than one year, yeah. I mean, that's not a good look. Oh, who was that other quarterback? Like, just kept getting passed around. Couldn't find a starting role oh, anywhere. Oh, my God. Ugh. Trying to think. Cam Newton? There's yeah, I mean that is one. I mean, yeah. There's, there's a ton of quarterbacks that get passed around like this, and they typically. But he was on like it. twelve teams. This who yeah. I'm thinking of. I mean Baker's off to a bad start. This is only his what fourth season. No, it's has no, he been that long? This will be his sixth, isn't it? Oh wow, I think so. I don't know why it felt like it wasn't that long. Yeah. How many did he have with the Browns? Uh, four, three, three or four. Yeah, but then I mean he was in Carolina. Carolina, LA, and here all within like one season. But I think last year was his fifth. So I think he was four years with the Browns. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Baker's got two options at this point either go sell insurance <laughs> or you're going to be a great second or third string quarterback. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Like it's, it's like Brian Hoyer. Just that's it. Yeah. That's all you've got. And maybe you'll get lucky and mm-hmm. the starter will get injured and uh, you'll have a you know, a limited time off. to shine, I guess, yeah. but he's not going to do anything in Tampa Bay. To answer your original question, and, and I mean no disrespect here to you in particular, but like when Tom Brady was on their team last year, Tampa Bay was not a very good team. Yeah. So, like, do you think with Baker Mayfield they're going to be that much better? Yeah. I heard I don't. They were they were an eight and nine team. They went to the playoffs. They lost to the Cowboys in the first round. I don't think Baker Mayfield is going to make that team. Any right. Better. So, with that being said, what's the why even? They're winning a Super Bowl. What are watch. they looking to pick him up for? What are, what are they getting out of bringing him on? It's the free agent market. They don't have the money to compete with anybody better right now, so they have to hope, you know, make a wish on Baker Mayfield and hope that it grows, which, you know, as the Rams showed, there's a little hope there, but the thing you don't realize is he was a starter in weeks 14 through 16, so he's playing against B yeah be defenses by that point um you know, his own team was hurt by injury, so like we never really got the real picture out of him. I don't see it happening. I think honestly, like he'll try to make the most of this opportunity, but the Buccaneers is not a team where he will succeed. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and it sucks. I, I, I've been a Baker fan since the start. I, I mean, I just liked him as a person. We both think he should still be in Cleveland. Yeah. And it's sad to see that his, I mean, he went from having such high hopes and it's just been an absolute failure. So it sucks. I mean, and just have to keep moving around like that. I mean, that's hard on your family. Yeah, I thought I mean, Carolina would have been a better fit for him. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of problems with Carolina. Like, it, it goes to management. It's a lot like Cleveland. Like, so there's not a lot of room for success, but I thought he would have thrived in that kind of offense. Yeah. Yeah. I thought he was going to do well in with the Rams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like, I, I really thought that, like, they were going to keep him around and they are going to, you know. He's a, as you said, he's a perfect backup quarterback. I mean, yeah. he's not going to beat out Matthew Stafford for the starting job. But, like, I mean, now they're talking about they're shopping Matthew Stafford, too. So, like. <laughs> You know, should you have kept him? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if you're Baker, are you willing to take that seat? Yeah. Or do you want to go somewhere to be the starter? I mean, he's 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 so young at this point still in his career to give up that, you know, QB one spot this early on. I mean, that's not saying much for a long standing career for you. And, and like he's kind of been thrust in the spotlight like right away. So like with Cleveland, we don't have a big media market, but it's Cleveland. Like they expect you to win right now. And there's no excuses if you don't. Um, Then he went to, you know, you said Carolina there for a cup of coffee, but then he went to LA, which is the biggest media market in in the country with, with New York. And like, if you don't win, like it's automatically a lot of pressure for him to be put into. So I can understand maybe why he wouldn't want that. Why, you know, he would embrace a team like Tampa Bay with open arms. It's just, there's not a lot there, especially now that they've released Leonard Fournette too. That came this week too. So like, they're without their star running back. Um, they don't have a great receiving core outside of Mike Evans. Uh, I don't see it happening. Yeah, it's not looking good. Um, and then you've got Rogers, who they haven't said the deal is official yet, this but he's guy. basically saying that like they're in trade talks and he plans to be playing for the well, Jets. The Jets have to acquire a certain number of players for yeah. Rodgers to make the move. This guy's yeah. the Jets head coach. He's the Packers GM. He's the fucking starting quarterback. <laughs> How many fucking jobs does this guy have? Yeah. He's making a mockery of the free agency right now. Yeah. That's I mean, you're I mean, he's good. I mean, we can't we can't take that away from him. But this late in your career, you think you have that much say in what fucking is going on? Yeah. Like, bro. You're not the, the MVP LeBron candidate anymore. Right. Of right. 
Yeah, NFL. Brought, in, brought in the NFL. Yeah, gets to choose who and what and where. I guess OBJ's. They he wants them to sign. That's one of his desires. Yeah, that's another thing too. I'm like, he has targets that he wants signed to New York if he comes to New York. Fuck you, man. Like yeah. we'll sign who we want to fucking sign, and you'll play with whoever we tell you to play with. Right, Tom Brady didn't. Or even stay your ass and right. You know, no, Bay. no, Tom Brady. So like Brady had once he was on the team. Keep in mind he had suggestions. Like he loved Fournette. What was a big? Uh, he he wanted to go after Leonard Fournette because of what he did in Jacksonville. But like he wasn't saying like, well, I'm not going to come to your team if you don't get this guy. Yeah, exactly. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's wild. I I think he's a little late off in in the career at this point to yeah. be thinking he's able to make those sorts of decisions uh and i feel like he's gonna put himself in a lamar, lamar position where he's gonna get screwed because he's, mm-hmm. he's gonna want too much and he's making himself look bad with the packers and then if the jets can't acquire what he wants and he can't go there then what do you fucking do you and we, know? we like, talked about that next last week you know the whole lamar thing and then like th- there really hasn't been much movement since like i mean they're really at a stalemate right now between yeah. both sides and it, it's so sad because lamar is coming into his own as a starting qb he's i would easily say top 10 quarterback in the nfl yeah. um uh, there's one guy who used to be on the show who would probably disagree but that's his problem not mine yeah. um lamar is a, a solid talent and like to see his career if he's going to sit out whatever he's going to do he, he's going to compromise it yeah well that's bringing uh o- odell back into the talk there were two teams Wild. that went to his practice and it was the browns and the ravens <laughs> the browns man. so Jesus. the browns might try to get him there's again. no way he there's no way he will the sign there, he can't well, sign the 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 head button was between him, him and, and baker, baker and baker's not there anymore so no. maybe bring him to the bus Deshaun watson obj i think he'd play with them mm-hmm. but also on the other side with with lamar yeah. maybe if if baltimore signs obj i can't wait for the headline lamar might be back in ready to play oh, right yeah can you imagine cleveland fans the ones well i mean we've seen this with lebron fuck you one second and then yeah. love you come back <laughs> right please he's another one that i like though that i thought kind of got the shaft like dan said we talked about it on the show several times the chemistry between him and baker just was not there yeah. they could not see eye to eye on the field or just they didn't connect you know the right way and i think that played a lot of the downfall of like obj looking like he was not successful and the things he did in los angeles i mean he would have been the mvp of that super bowl had he not gotten injured everybody knows that right for sure um other big big trade was uh zeke What's going on uh, with him? Uh, released. Or released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so he's on the free agent market right now to anybody that wants him. The thing with Zeke Elliott is that from the second that he was signed to a new deal three years ago, everybody knew, even for a kid that was a top five back such as he was, it was too much money. And that, like, ultimately, like, his level of success wasn't worth that number. So, you know, here we are three years later. The Cowboys are no further to their championship qua- conquest and – you know, ultimately, Tony Pollard's a better running back. He's more yards per gain. He's more powerful, um, younger. So they like that. Yeah. And they're going to stick with Tony P. Yeah. Now, do you think that they're officially releasing Zeke and going to actually get rid of him? Or do you think they release him and then they re-sign him for less money? For it to a new deal? And I think that's possible. I think that's a very good point. Um, the only reason I would say no is that from the very start, Zeke said that he was willing to restructure his contract to stay in Dallas. He wanted to stay in Dallas. He said he'll do it right now. So, I mean, there there is that chance, possibly. Um, but I, I think we're going to find out in the next day because not many teams are going to let it back like that go. I just feel so bad for him because, like, the last memory I have was, like, him, like, playing center and getting fucking trampled. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid play, man. <laughs> Oh my God. It's like the last play that like Dallas fans are going to fucking see and remember this guy by. And it's that like... was Kellen Moore's last play call at Dallas. And then he goes to Sandy or Los Angeles chargers and like becomes their new offensive coordinator. I'm like, all right, well, take them. Fine. Jeez. Juju's going to the Patriots, Patriots baby. Yeah. I'm happy. Really? About that That's a good signing. I'm happy that about is a that good one. I just posted about actually. They need a number one. And I think Juju can thrive in that environment. I really do. He was with the Chiefs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Won his ring and I liked him. That's yeah. it. And the Chiefs are going to have to make some room anyway because there's, they said that there's a few NFL quarterbacks who have gone unnamed, have said they want to play with Patrick Mahomes. So, like, I think they're going to start clearing some cap space out and start signing some of these big. It's more next year. Um, there'll be more wide receivers coming out next year, but um, yeah, a lot of guys want to play with the current greatest. 
They want that easy ring, I guess. Yep. Um, outside of the football stuff, anything, anything I missed? Anything important with new new Tiger news? Oh, there was new Tiger Woods updates that we, me and Dan, briefly talked about. So we talked about Tiger Woods. It was on the last episode, yep. right? Yes, sir. Um, and um, his girlfriend and the NDA and this, that, and the other thing. And apparently, further news came out shortly after we recorded, and we were unsure if they had broken up. We're going to break up. We thought maybe she was just kind of looking for future things. Or we th- we initially thought, okay, something's going to come out about Tiger. You know, there's something that he did, uh, another sexual assault accusation or something. And it seemingly has come out that uh, he had broken up with her and wanted her to leave the house and, and everything like that. And then after that is when she asked for the NDA to be nullified. Um, and she basically wants to be able to capitalize on the relationship and, have you know a book deal or interviews and things like that and make money um my issue with that is is she's in her in her notice whatever it was that she let out to the news about wanting it released she she specifically cites this whole well based on like if you're a sexual assault victim you have the right to talk about it and she used that as a ploy to want it released but she hasn't come out and said there's anything that has happened like that so i'm like no you signed the nda you knew what you were getting into if I'm the judge, I hope that they fucking hold withstand it. I hope that they don't let her off just so she can try and make some fucking money off of him. Like you have no reason that to not to have it released. Yeah. She she's, made that agreement. She's suing him for fifty million dollars too. Is it fifty now or was it wasn't it thirty? It? it was or 30, thirty million. Thirty, yeah. 30 million. Oh, like she ain't getting fifty, that's for sure. She's suing him for thirty because he kicked her out of the house. That's his house. Because they had a verbal agreement that she could live there for six years. You're broken up with, bitch. You're gonna still live in his house? Yeah, nah, boy, get out of here. Yeah, I mean, we we speculated for a long time last week in terms of what we thought that could be. I mean, at first, I wasn't so on to the idea that Tiger did something. But once you guys started kind of talking more about it and like why you would actually pursue something like that, yeah. I'm like, man, this does not look good for Tiger. Like yeah. it, it's, you know, because the thing is, even if she lies about it, as long as she pursues it, it's going to drag his reputation. Sure. The mud, and that's the one thing he can't afford to lose. And I think it fully 180 at this point, though. Last week we were like, OK, this is going to make him look bad mm-hmm. now, which just makes her look like a gold digger. Yeah. She's clearly just after potential money based on the fact that she dated him. Vengeance. And that's yeah. the whole reason she's trying to fight or people are trying to say that's why, you, you know, having an NDA right. is you know, you're shady or you shouldn't need that. And I'm like, this, she's a perfect example of why. Yeah. Because you have to protect yourselves from people that just want to be with you because they want to be able to make a buck off Talk of it. About it time. To... Yeah. yeah. Fuck that. Unfortunately, lawsuits like this, you know, she'll sue for so much money, yeah. an unrealistic amount of money because they'll settle. They'll for... settle for her. Uh, what five percent of that? Right. She gets half yeah. that. She's happy. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I say. You you can get three percent of fifty million, and you could still be fine. Yeah. So it's like, so is it is it worth it to to drag it out in court? Court costs and all that shit, uh, lawyer costs and fees, uh, or just settle, settle with the gold digger. Yeah. Get the fuck on. out of your life. I mean, that's it's so easy, and that's what a lot of people are are, are you know a lot of athletes will do. You know, that's why it's, it's out of court, uh, undisclosed amount. They settle. That's the shit that happens yeah. nowadays. So. Yeah. It's whack. It's just, yeah, it's it, just so it lame. cracks me up the way they want to, his team went about getting her out of the house. I thought it was fake. I thought it was fake. <laughs> what <happened? laughs> How'd they do it? They, they told her they're going on a, a vacation and <laughs> like told her to airport. meet them at the airport. And when they got to the airport, they tell her there's no vacation. <laughs> the The locks are being changed at the house. You're kicked out. You're done. Move on. Fantastic. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, as they're like leaving or whatever, they're packing and get ready. Like, no, nah, maybe you better take all your makeup. Like, right. maybe you better take like, all the rings, <laughs> all your clothes. We're going to be gone for a long time. They probably brought extra luggage and left it with her. So she had to pay for like Bring all two Ubers. pairs of shoes. <laughs> but yeah, she My wanted... bulldog does not need to go on this trip. <laughs> The verbal agreement was for her to live in his mansion for six years. And, and Tiger's like, that that was not said. Yeah. And even if it, it was, I mean, the, the I insinuation that you would live there while you guys are broken up and live that lifestyle for that's so awkward five extra years. Still got six days and three hours on my contract, man. I'm that's staying right here. <laughs> Dude, it's fucking wild. Water. I, I hope I hear another bullshit lawsuit. Yeah. Uh, did you hear about the guy 
or well, random individual that is suing Buffalo Wild Wings. No. Oh because yeah. Because they're claiming that the boneless wings are not actually wings. Oh my god. Chicken <laughs> they'll nuggets. win. They'll win too. Yeah. That's 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 the crazy part about it. Is they'll fucking win. How would you know how much? I don't. Oh my god, I got to know the numbers. It's, 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 it's probably ridiculous. I think it's like a million dollars. <laughs> they'll give them a they'll give them fifty thousand dollars, and it'll just be another day. Yeah, you imagine it's shit that you. you Here's that a coupon. See here and go. Points. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. yeah. Like, hey, babe, I need to pay the house off. Let's sue Buffalo Wild Wings for some bullshit reason. We'll settle for you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and call it a day. Huh? He, he gets it all in a gift card. Yeah. <laughs> Lifetime supply of boneless nuggets. <laughs> Come eat our wings, bitch. Boneless nuggets. <laughs> We're going to settle for 150000 in wings. <laughs> Soul. That's fucking stupid. I would cry. Cry oh. laughing if that were the case. They put it on a gift card. That's so Dude, good. Fantastic. <laughs> what a way Store to get credit. back at them. Like, now you have to stick with us. All right. All right. I think that's all for sports. We don't want to drag it out too far. We got lots of other things to talk about. So we'll hit up. Uh, let's get social next. It is July 20th, 1969. Mm-hmm. And man is about to land on the moon. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. And freedom will be defended. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. That's the way. When you're updating that, we could turn that into like a tiger soundbite there. That, yeah. that part with Bill. Right, get the fuck out, bitch. Yeah. Or something like that. <laughs> We're going on vacation. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> get your bags. <laughs> All right. Let's get social. One and only topic. We're going to knock this out. And uh, it's the the downfall, the collapse, the demise of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. This is the first like big bank fallout that's happened in quite some time. It's actually the number two largest bank assets to have collapsed um ever you know it's it's the number two uh, worst um but so anyways over the last week signature bank our silicon valley bank in california um was officially taken over by the fdic for um inability to maintain uh, operation um and a direct relation to that then signature bank in new york ended up collapsing um, and a lot of people don't really understand what that means or how that works or, you know, basically what happened. So um, Silicon Valley Bank was basically um, majority of their clientele were venture capitalists, small businesses. You know, Silicon Valley is known for all of their like tech type stuff. It's where like Apple and all that kind of stuff is. Um, so pre- pre- predominantly what's that? Implants. Yes, exactly. Implants. They probably do have a lot of people that get implants there. Um, but Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so basically what happened, I was reading into this because I was kind of curious what what caused the downfall. And because of what their clientele, majority of their clientele was, with it being um, smaller businesses and um, adventure capitalist business, it's a lot of cash demand. Um, you know, you're constantly looking to try and get invested in certain things to get like upstarts, uh, get business upstarts. And with everything that's happened with the economy over the last couple of years, um, small businesses have been really affected and, and uh, you know, have had more needs for capital. Mm-hmm. And due to that, there was a large demand of cash being needed from the accounts that these um, clients had with them. What what the issue became was, is that because of the need for so much cash, the bank needs to be able to have the ability to give that cash to you. Yeah. They, the money isn't made up. They actually have to have it in either assets or cash on hand. So Silicon Valley had such a large demand for cash from their clients that they were actually off. Uh, they were selling off assets, but they needed to get cash so quickly. They were selling off assets under value. So okay. they were taking a loss and they were taking such a high amount of loss to get the cash they needed to give to their clients because you have to have it available to them when they need it mm-hmm. um, that their stocks were starting to tumble. They were starting to lose value within the bank, which became an investor scare and it just domino affected. Everyone was losing faith in the business or in the bank and they wanted to take their money out. And it got to a point where they were losing cash way faster than they could prov- produce, they could produce the, the money, get rid of assets to do it. And the bank just failed. So this is they why like, 
as a consequence, so many other banks are telling their patrons not to not to freak out. Like, you know, like, don't worry, it, it's it's not a big yeah. deal. Like, because if, if they start ripping their money out, same shit's going to happen with them, too. And, it, and it's happened. So I have a lot of friends that work in the financial industry and, and they were saying over this past week, they've had tons of clients coming in asking about the FDIC limits. What's the maximum amount of cash I'm covered for within a bank account? So um the the amount is 250,000 in an account is covered by the FDIC that's the the insure that's what insures your money yeah. if a bank were to collapse so in the instance of silicon valley under normal circumstance anybody that had over $250,000 in an account would lose everything over that they would get their 250,000 and anything in excess of that you're at a loss you yeah. to prevent a freak out in all of the banking industry as a whole to prevent like another 2008 the fdic is going to honor the full amount of cash that were in the accounts for everyone that was associated Eesh. it's not a government bailout there we're, the government has already come out and said we're not doing another 2008 we're not bailing them out you know your fdic insured you'll get that money but the fdic stepped in and said look this is going to have a far worse ripple effect if we don't guarantee the assets to these people so they're mm -hmm. going to do so um just to prevent an overall panic and just economic downfall but then signature bank in new york which is a smaller bank and they dealt with a lot of crypto like they were one of the, the one of the few banks that allowed um the transaction of crypt cryptocurrency and exchange of cryptocurrency but friday of last week when it became a when it became aware that um silicon valley was going under people panicked and started pulling cash and they pulled so much cash from signature that they literally collapsed, not as a result of anything that they did, yeah, but the they fear. didn't, they could not keep up with the demand because of the size of bank that they were. Yeah. They didn't have the availability to be able to maintain what was being requested and they went under. So this would of course be easier to happen to a smaller bank. You Absolutely. Know, is that what history has traditionally shown? Like more smaller banks are closing because of this particular thing. Yeah. You, I mean, you see a lot of, so over the years, lots of smaller banks have gone away or you've seen banks acquire. So like Huntington national is no longer a thing. I think they got acquired by citizens and uh, PNC took over for, uh, was it bank one or no bank one got bought out by chase. Okay. So there's you, lots of banks have been acquired over the years and they've kind of become bigger entities. You've got like Bank of America, Fifth Wells Third? Fargo. Fifth Third is still around. Is They're a regional still? bank. He banks regional. Um, but a lot of the smaller banks do end up not being able to withstand. And so with this happening, one of the positives, I guess, from it, if you want to call it a positive, is that the government has stated um, at their next quarterly meeting that they're they're going to halt the increase in interest rates because they want to make sure that they can try and balance things back out. And that the increase in interest rates has a direct effect on the income that banks can have because they're not able to lend as often because people can't afford it. So banks are being able to do less loans, which is income for them because people don't want to pay 8% for a mortgage mm -hmm. and the smaller banks can't keep up. You know, they aren't able to lend, which is money that they're not getting brought in. And we've had so many rate increases over the last year um, that they came out and they said, we're going to we're going to slow at this point. If it is, it's going to be a minimal rate increase, um, not like they've been doing like quarter percent consistently, half percent consistently over the last uh, year. Every quarter they've been raising it. It's been insane. So here's my question. Why now? Like why? So obviously like COVID, the big brunt of COVID was 2020, yeah. which was three years ago. Why has this taken three years to finally impact? So it was just a matter of the the amount of assets they had to offload to be able to maintain the cash need, it just finally caught up to them. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of this happening over the course of the last, you know, year, two years. And that when your stock just starts to tumble, the faith just got lost in the bank at that point, so, basically. So it just hasn't subdued the borrowing or the taking out just hasn't subdued. They weren't able to recoup. So the issue is, is that they had to, they had to sell off so many assets to, to create the cash they needed. Yeah. But with the way that the economy has been trending where it's not gotten better, they haven't been able to replenish the assets and the income that they need to be able to maintain operation. And they, they failed.
You know, it's not something where people should be concerned like you brought up, you know, about your normal bank. This was a unique scenario. It's a unique clientele that banked within this firm. Mm -hmm. it, this wasn't your everyday bank where your everyday person was going to, you know, it's not like your it's Bank not, of America or Chase right. or Wells Fargo. Yeah, it, it, their, their, their clients were a very specific type of client. Um, so it's not anything you should, that the majority of people should be concerned about, but it, it does allow people to kind of wonder and ask questions that they might not know about, you know, as far as like the FDIC insurance and stuff like that goes and what you are covered with. Yeah. It makes people wonder. And it's good to be educated on that because a lot of people don't know. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately for us, we don't have to worry about that. At least me, I don't have fucking $250,000 yeah, right. in cash in the bank. So no, I, where I, do, uh, uh, where do credit unions fall into something like that? Credit unions aren't FDIC insured. So credit union fails your fuck. Yep, credit unions are independently operated and they don't have to follow the same regulations as of a, a federal federal could regulated they, bank. Could they fall just as quick? I mean, like, yeah, I mean, could, yeah. With that happening in those banks, people in credit unions, are they? Yeah, they I mean, start. You could. I want my money out of the bank now. Yeah, because technically, so I mean, that's the thing that most people don't. I guess realize or people think like I'm just gonna go in the bank and I can get my cash right then and there, which technically you can, but you have to. I mean, Usually you're not limits. walking into yeah, you're not walking into a bank and walking out with two hundred grand. Yeah, you know you have to give Once them notice. Yeah, well, even then, probably not because banks can't keep that much cash on hand. And, and if you don't mind, I'm supposed to. I'll take Dan's question. Okay, I'll, I'll answer yeah. this for you. Stop buying five hundred dollar fucking shoes. Yeah. I don't. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, credit unions can uh, credit unions are operated differently, but they can't uh they could fail just as much. I mean, if they ran into a if they ran into a position where they had um their clientele need to have access to their cash and they couldn't support it, that's what happens. I, I feel like with if that scare happened in, in California and it affected New York, yeah, and these credit unions mm -hmm. being smaller, yeah. We could easily shut down a ton of those. Yeah, I don't I don't think I think people will hopefully, you know, because uh, for the most part, it's been forthcoming as far as what's going on. It's being talked about. The government is trying to issue. Obviously, they don't want people to panic unnecessarily. And it's not a, it, you have to really look at the clientele that they had at both banks, you know, and that the way that they operated uh, Signature Bank put themselves in a very um unique situation with the cryptocurrency and everything like that i mean we've talked about it on here before it's not a backed yeah uh, it's not a backed currency you know and when you put yourself in a position where you have that type of clientele the scare is easy um and you know this is what happens so it's unfortunate they'll get acquired uh both of them i'm sure will get um bought out um their assets acquired by another larger bank so that uh those branches and stuff become something else um, or the assets get sold off to recoup some of the money that has been lost. But yeah, I'm wondering when this uh, this Dogecoin is gonna never. make a return. I'm losing money right now. Yeah, because everyone's because that I looked at it. So I looked at crypto uh, when this happened to see if it would so sway the, people one way or the other, uh, and it's it's stagnant. It's not going anywhere. Um, but yeah, so that's I mean it's it's pretty big. Again, this hasn't happened in a long time. Smaller banks have closed over the last several years for different situations, but not to a level like this and this quickly where it has uh, affected another another bank like this has. So hopefully we'll get another Adam McKay movie out of it where we get Margot Robbie in a bubble bath explaining to us how fiduciaries <laughs> work. Buying me. I want to see her in a bubble bath. I need to buy that. It's one movie I, I've always wanted to own and I have not bought. Make sure it's so it's great. so good. Um, but yeah, so that's big. That's the big news really this week in Let's Get Social. I'm sure there's other things that we could talk about, but we're not going to. We're going to do Hollywood, and then we're going to do Made to Motivate. So Chris is going to talk about movies. And boobies. Oh my God! Okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. What's the procedure, everyone? What's the procedure? Stay, What's the procedure? stay calm! Wait, 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 wait. Everybody calm down! Hollywood. What the fuck was that? Sorry, I, <laughs> I blacked out during that whole last segment. <laughs> Whoops. Steve Carell's yelling does that for me too. Uh, sorry, when I look at Dan on the computer, it's just this. This is forehead. <laughs> no. Why are you um, looking at me? 
Deadpool. You, sh- you should make like a, a mix of like him and Jesse doing it back and forth. Right. We can make it look. I was like trying to see how much money other. I lost it in Dogecoin. Lost, lost it? How much money did you lost it over how there? Much I lost in Dogecoin. Dan, Chris, what's going on in movies? Ryan. Dan, Chris, Norm, Steve. <laughs> what's up, Christopher? Breaking what's... news today. Oh yeah, what is it? And we finally got some good news out of DC. Oh boy. Um, 2025. James Gunn has finally stamped his name to a project. He is going to direct Superman Legacy. Starring Chris Pratt. In 2025. There is <laughs> no casting yet. This is in the infancy stage. But so there is a possibility that Chris Pratt would be the next Platt. Superman. Platt. Platt. It, it, there's not only a possibility, it is probably going to fucking happen. Yes. There's no doubt. He'll play Superman. He'll play Lois Lane. He'll play, <laughs> who's the fucking Perry? Uh, Perry Mason? The, the, no, no. The police chief. The, Lawrence Fishburne name. was a good last name for Perry Mason. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, th- this is good news. I mean, at least they're they're putting their positive step forward, and it seems like they've uh, finally cut off the Henry Cavill era, like it's come to an end. Um, how do you guys feel about this? To me, me personally, I'm not the biggest Superman fan in the world, but if James Gunn is involved, that kind of piques my interest a little bit. That we're finally going to get some kind of personality to to the Superman character. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Heard Cavill might be a, a villain at some point in the DC world. Yeah. How's that happen? You can't just go from Superman to a villain. I guess you if you're redoing do everything and wiping the slate clean. The fans aren't going to see a redo. That's hard to do when you're that far in. Yeah. Yeah. So, Norm, whatever. what do you think? Um, I've never been a Superman guy. Same. Um, I've actually, when it comes to DC and the DC universe, I've actually had more enjoyment Wonder watching Woman. the uh the villains yeah and like the batman series like i absolutely love joker and they the have Batman. better villains they are my two favorite villains of all time but yeah. when you look at like the marvel universe all all heroes you know it's it's, it's so easy to, to love the heroes but in dc they have just made a train wreck of, of the superheroes in, in that series and the so Never been a big Superman guy, though, personally. Yeah. And, well, and, and what's strange about this, too, is that, like, unlike obvious directors before him, James Gunn is now kind of the, the new head of DC. He's taken over as kind of like the godfather who they've handed over this rights and reigns to. So he basically has full access. Do what you may uh, to this character, to this story, everything. Um, so so it's in his hands and you can look at that two ways you can look at it as you know the James Gunn of Guardians of the Galaxy obviously my favorite Marvel property you could look at it as the Suicide Squad that that he took the Suicide Squad under with the the new rehashing of Idris Elba and Margot Robbie and all that sucked so you, you've got that balance there. Like, where where did they find that in and, and Superman lends itself to being such an overtly serious character that it's interesting to put this director in that in that rain i mean you gotta it's gonna be hard it's gonna be very difficult for him to kind of find like that new genre if he's gonna add anything new he's gonna create a new series with superman because the legacy of superman no pun intended i guess the title of the movie but um the following in the community in the dc universe especially superman i mean that dates back like way yeah. the fuck back born here you Cleveland. you change that mm-hmm you're going to have all the comic book nerds coming out and you are going to get fucking torched. I think outside of Batman, there's probably no other franchise in that world that fans care more about. Maybe Star Wars. And that, well, you said that just in DC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Just in DC. Um, Yeah. I don't think there is like, like Batman, even Batman's arguable. I mean, Superman has his legions of fans just because I'm not one, you know, Ryan, what do you think? I like Superman. I like Christopher Reeve Superman. Mm -hmm. Um, I did like Cavill though. I like I'm disappointed that they're they're parting ways with him for that part. Yeah. Um, it's not my favorite. DC as a whole isn't really my favorite thing, though. I mean, outside of Batman, they just haven't done anything that exciting. Like they've just continued to fail for the most part. So I'll be interested to see what he does, you know, and hopefully that this is a new era for them and that he does it right. Mm-hmm. And to Norm's point, like, don't fuck this up. It mm-hmm. is a very big name in the franchise. So He's got to do it right. I think it's got to be cast correctly. And that, like, I don't know, like, that, even though Cavill and Reeves were obviously two completely different actors, like, they look and fit the part very well. So it's like, who are you going to put in that position going forward that's going to fit the 
the right criteria, you know, and not change it too much. These guys were nobodies when they took the role. So like yeah. you almost have to go of that same cloth. Like it has to be an, an unknown, right. you know, I mean, Chris Hemsworth was a nobody when he took yeah. Thor and, and man, the guy burst onto the scene. Right. Um, funny enough, the uh, s- side story. Did you guys hear that uh, the Shazam marketing as far I posted about this last mm-hmm. night, I didn't really want to talk about it too much. I'm not going to reveal what happened, but um, so DC and their marketing of Shazam, they dropped their last TV spot yesterday and um, a certain cameo got oh, revealed yeah. in this TV spot. And now everybody knows about it. This was a pretty big surprise uh that that would have been on this film and, and now they it's just totally over. yeah they, they i don't understand <laughs> who put this trailer together who put this spot together and, and they accepted it and said yeah we want we want that out there like do it in the theater man make yeah. it to where you know fans are coming out of it and going like wow now we know you know or now all that that's crazy who is it <sighs> maybe they're gonna change it up maybe it's just to think make you think Wait, well, that would be awesome when shazam come out next weekend it comes out tomorrow i mean the early screenings are tomorrow friday so who is it by the time ryan gets this episode out oh yeah i don't care i just watched the original yesterday okay you you care i don't give a shit it's wonder woman oh interesting so like so what happens is the way i understand it just the context of how it's edited uh the female of the shazam group is like on the ground or whatever like she's hurt or something like she's you know kind of nursing an injury and wonder woman swoops in and like she's like starstruck by her like oh my god and then she kind of walks away and you just see gal gadot just smiling and laughing about something that was gonna be my question is it gal gadot or yeah it's gal gadot guys? definitely gal gadot. It, she step away from that property as well or no i thought she was done they said they, they have not said anything on her future and i, I okay. guess if you're going to keep anybody that's probably the one that made the most bang out, out of you know the justice I- league I would say so. I mean, yeah, she, she has a powerful figure. Yeah, yeah. Like, wait, does is that the right words? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I second that. When when I watch those movies, I'm like, damn. Yeah, yeah. She and and like can't can't get rid of her feelings about Wonder Woman eighty four aside. She's right for the role. Yeah, in, in my opinion. Um, and, and I feel like I just feel like this this shock though would have been huge coming out of the theater yeah. man like that's that's almost my problem we've, we've talked about this endlessly about trailers and how they market them too much is being revealed these days this is just goes to show in my opinion that they don't they don't have enough confidence that people are going to go yeah and see it and they're like well maybe if we give them this they'll be intrigued enough to want to know more that's crazy that is a good point yeah, i didn't even think about you that know. i mean you really have that little of confidence that's but crazy at, in the same that's point movie they you it, word of mouth is going to sell that movie too even after they see it once yeah. so people if one, start critics, one person says wonder woman then yeah, yeah. people are going to want to go see it yeah it's, it's going to get out so keep it quiet until that first yeah. release night like let I agree let people talk about it instead of showing i i i'm with you with can chris on i agree with you i just that's what i'm thinking of the reason they might have did it like i don't Maybe. think they should have uh, DC just continues to fucking Maybe they're fail, so man. excited. Like, oh, she's in the movie. Let's show. School. They want to, like, show it off. Yeah, I don't understand this uh, move. And, like, to me, like, as to where that was. She peed, mom. <laughs> peed up. Where, where it was hinted at in the first movie, only hinted at, this full-on confirms that it is in that same universe as yeah. the Justice League, as everybody else. That's a big crossover moment. Mm-hmm. Like, how you let that just wither away with some TV spots beyond me. Yeah. Yeah, and, and but James Gunn's in it now, and it's it's all gone because yeah. it's going to recast everything. Yeah, it's I, I don't know where they're going, man. I just I hope this is a good movie. I like the first Shazam. I really like the first Shazam. It's real good. Um, I'm hoping this lives up to it. Yeah, I'm a little worried about how long they've prolonged it. You know, obviously it's been there's years. COVID. Yeah, it's it's been done for almost two years now. So yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Um, other news coming out today, uh, Quentin Tarantino's final movie, um, his 10th and final film has been revealed. It is reportedly titled The Movie Critic, and he is planning to direct the film this fall. 
Wow. So jokes aside that I've gotten over the last 24 hours. Say, are you guest starring in this movie? Yeah. I would love to be in a Tarantino film. Um, but that's kind of who Tarantino was. He wasn't an official movie critic before his career started, but the guy worked at a blockbuster video. He was a, a movie nerd, total movie nerd when he was in his teens. And I feel like this is going to be another one of those intimate projects to him, a lot similar to um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he includes a lot of inside jokes about the business, a lot of nuance and you know quirks uh that that he pulls from his own particular years um nothing else has been revealed about this film it's really he he said he's in the middle of writing the script um it's not finished yet obviously no casting but you know on the heels of his other nine films Mm -hmm. i mean it's tarantino man you got to be excited right dan yeah yeah so I I I, I, I don't know. It's like yeah, sure. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> what movies has he made? <laughs> uh, to name a few: Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, Kill Kill Bill One and Two, Death Proof, Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained, The Hateful Eight, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now, what? Why is this his last film? He has just decided he he doesn't want to do it. Into he is quoted as saying like he doesn't want to overstay his welcome in Hollywood. That he's always wanted to be involved in the business, but just as a producer capacity. Um, making a film is so stressful and you know putting the pieces together and everything has to be a perfect storm i get like it being stressful and everything that that's a good that's that's a logical excuse to me but overstaying your welcome in hollywood and i I don't i don't buy that i mean this is his 10th film yeah Yeah. 10 films and how long has he been on the scene? I mean, Pulp I mean, Fiction. Was Pulp Fiction. Uh, Pulp Fiction was ninety. Yeah, he's been around four, five. Yeah, I mean, you got ten films in the last thirty. You might as well say thirty years. Thirty. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's you're not overstaying your welcome, man. Yeah. No, I don't yeah. think. I don't think so because a majority of those films I look at as great. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a film in that list where I downright don't like it. I'm even the guy that sticks up for Death Proof as to well. Say Death Proof is not really a lot of people don't like Death Proof, and I understand that. But like, I'm the guy that I'm like, I love Death Proof. Like, and I would say if any of them, probably Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was like the one I'm I like, was, I don't care as much. See, I love that one. Did you? I just, I just like the storytelling. I was everything was in reverse. Yeah, and I, I loved it. It was genius to me. And Brad and Leo have such great chemistry. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, the, the, like I said, you know, very little is known about the film. It's just that he said he, he'd like to set it in the seventies, similar to once upon a time in Hollywood in Los Angeles, similar to once upon a time in Hollywood with a female lead at its center. So Margot Robbie, there you go. Could be your girl. Mm. Um, I think we will look forward to it either way. And, you know, to say goodbye to the man, it's going to be tough. What's your favorite Tarantino film of the ones I've listed? The identical. 100%. 100%. Identical. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just fucking with you. Fuck you. <laughs> I'd have to say it, it's between Reservoir Dogs and Django Unchained. Django's a great choice, man. What's your real one, Norm? I uh, Probably Pulp Fiction. Pulp it was like, the, it, I mean, it was, it was the first That's one that a, I ever saw. Mm-hmm. And I saw it years way after it already came out. Mm-hmm. Um, suggested by uh, my stepfather. I was like, yeah, yeah, check this out. Really? You know, it was just one of those, just one of those movies where I sat down and I watched by myself and was like, what the fuck? How man? old were you? I was a teenager, man. Oh, man. Yeah, it was, I just had no idea what was happening. I had to rewatch it over and over again. It was mm-hmm. like, you know, John Travolta's uh, dead over here, but then later in the film, he's alive. I'm like, what is happening? I had to watch it a few times. What's in the case? Yeah, it was, it, but Pulp Fiction is definitely good choice yeah. good choice what about you ryan uh la, 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 la. i'd pick one from each era uh i'd say reservoir dogs kill bill and then uh Django mm-hmm. or Django. i always say did Django. it's just Django, right yeah i'm a fucking idiot <laughs> it's hard to pick just you one enunciate but D. but uh yeah like if i picked one from like <laughs> every 10 year span yeah, Reservoir Dogs, Kill Bill, and Django mm. for sure. I really did like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood though. That one's up there. I haven't seen that yet? It's good. Um, they're all. I mean, for the most part, they're all. Yeah, relatively good. Hateful Eight's honestly probably one of the only ones I do. I know like. you don't like it. Yeah, yeah. To me, like that's one of my favorites. Um, but like as far as his weakest film, I mean, I don't know. I guess I would say probably Kill Bill Two. Yeah. To be frankly honest, yeah. I. It didn't live up to the original. No, I thought that I remember seeing the second at a drive in and it's not one of those movies you watch at a drive in. Yeah, it's more so it's better in a theater. Yeah. What's your what would you pick as your favorite? Did you say? 
I mean, I love the hateful eight. I've, I've gotten so Dude, your favorite. And I've, and the thing is oh. the, the movie is like almost three hours long and it's so easy to rewatch for me. It's like Wolf of wall street where I'm like, I could put it on and just, it don't matter how long it is. It could be five fucking hours. I'm, I'm down. I, I like that. They broke it up into the chapters. Yeah. Oh, with the, the Netflix release. Yeah. 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 I like they, that. They did that. That, that edit is, it's a lot different. It feels like a different movie altogether, you know? Like it's it's the same pieces, but they're constructed cleverly, uh, diverse. Right. Enough. Yeah. Mm. So like off topic from the Quentin Tarantino, but still movie related. Mm-hmm. So like I I don't typically when I watch a movie, it's a one and done. Yeah. I watch it one time. I'll never watch it again. Even if you love it. But Jeez. the mo- now, but the movies that I enjoy is then I'll rewatch it. Okay. There is only one movie that I can think of. That I have rewatched like over and over and over again. It's the weirdest. It's not weird, but uh, Greyhound. Oh, the Tom, Hanks. the Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is good. The the not summer was the submarines, but the the he's naval, the World War Two yeah. naval. He's a naval commander. Last year or them. the year before? It was the year before. Yeah, that's like the one movie that I just I can watch over and over again. I'll never get tired of it. Really, it just amps me up, man. I don't know why. What about 300? You're a big 300 fan. I was. I actually saw 300 more times in theaters than any other movie I've ever seen. We we saw the second one together. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's 300 after a while. I said after a while, you kind of, there are, you ever notice there are certain parts, there are certain, uh, certain parts in a movie where you know it's coming up and you're like, ah, it's cringy as fuck. I don't want to watch that. Oh, yeah. It happens. 300 there's that part there, mm. there's that part for me in 300 where with uh with his wife and that and the the politician that kind of get me like man i don't want to yeah 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 you know, so like now I, is that like, the way it's portrayed or with time your thoughts have changed on that particular scene to where maybe something reflective of life you go i don't like that so much yeah well i don't i mean obviously i don't like that shit anyway and mm-hmm. in, in, in real life to begin with but yeah, yeah it, uh i don't like seeing like that's why i don't watch horror movies I don't like scream. You guys are like hey, scream. I hate scream. Yeah. I cannot stand. I cannot watch movies where women or children are being murdered, yeah. um, raped. I um, mean, I can't watch movies where animals are being killed. I can't do it. Yeah, like, animals it just, is tough for me. Like it's it's just one of those. Uh, as, as I said, that's why I don't watch horror movies. And I think that came from watching um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, <laughs> the original. Yeah, the original. <laughs> where like the guy, I remember like the guy like stepped on the girl's head and oh he yeah leg oh no no you're talking matthew mcconaughey was that the, the, part four the next generation was that what it was oh my god you watched mcconaughey's he like crushed her head yeah filmer he, he, yeah he's got and the radioactive you can leg here is like the girl like yeah and then just and that fucked with me um, house of a thousand corpses oh yeah messed my head up for mm-hmm. and I, I had him in weeks just just all like the torture, like the women torture yeah. scenes and rape scenes and stuff like that. I can watch the guy wear I can watch I can watch the guy wear some dude's face all day. That doesn't bother me at all, but I just can't watch like you know, like women, women and children. being tortured and stuff. I can't watch it. Interesting. Well, there's some movies I definitely won't be recommending to you. <laughs> His favorites. I know the pe- people see my movie shelf and they're like, Jesus, what a sad. Yeah, I know you're like a huge like horror movie guy i was raised on those films and like to me and i don't watch them for the same reason other people do like i've watched horror and i've never okay i won't say never i've rarely been scared or rarely been like oh my god that unnerves me so bad by it i I can watch horror and just be like that's what life would be like if i was in that particular (laughs) world but i'm not so like my wife loves horror movies yeah like jess she loves absolutely loves horror movies and i'm like no I that. Yeah. She also likes really stupid movies too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen those conversations. Yeah. Winter's Tale. Um uh transitioning on, we're going to talk a little bit of music here. Um one of my favorite uh 80s and 90s bands, I guess you could argue, The Cure, um is not only back with uh, a new worldwide tour They're coming to Cleveland and yeah. I can't wait. Um I'm actually on the list for tickets, which brings us to the conversation at hand. Um, the cure have said that they are going to market their concert purely to fans. They will not overprice tickets. They refuse to, and the tickets are not resellable. Obviously, Ryan, I've talked with you about this particular subject. This is nothing new as you've expressed before, but I personally think it's, it's the right direction. It's not perfect. And the cure have actually admitted this themselves in an article today released by billboard. It's not a perfect science, but it's a right step forward in the right direction after 
the things we've seen with the Taylor Swift concert that yep. we've talked about on this show. Um, how do you feel about this whole whole thing? I mean, I love their stance. I think it's admirable the, them coming out just and voicing it right off the start. Because, I mean, for for the artists themselves, there's no gain to them for their tickets to be resold for thousands of dollars. They're not re they're not getting any portion of that money. Mm -hmm. So if they want to make sure that their true fans are having access to see the to see them perform, you know, when they have a stadium full of people that truly want to come out and experience that, I think it's a great thing for them to at least try and set forth some sort of way to alleviate the the resale market. Mm -hmm. Um how they do it and kind of make it foolproof is going to be tough, but they can at least make it more difficult. You know, they can at least make the resellers more hesitant um, on wanting to try and capitalize on the market. So mm -hmm. I, I really, I commend them for it. I hope more artists follow suit. And I really hope, um, you know, Ticketmaster Live Nation step up and figure out a way to try and mend the situation, especially like, as you mentioned, after like the Taylor Swift thing, because that was just insane. Yeah. How, how do you manage that though? Like, how, how is it possible? Yeah, like I, which was my next question. To so Ryan. the resale. So what the, what they're saying is by not making it transferable. So what that so essentially with normal ticket sales like through a Live Nation, uh, you buy the tickets, you can go on your app and like so like I have several concerts coming up. They're all Live Nation. I can pull up my tickets on there and there's actually an option where I can transfer the ticket mm -hmm. like right from the app. You give me your phone number, your email, and I can transfer the ticket to you. So I could say, Hey, Chris, I'm going to sell you this ticket for 500 bucks. And I immediately transfer it to you digitally and you pay me. Yeah. So they're going to make it so that you cannot transfer it. So they're going to leave. They're going to eliminate basically live nation's going to have to set up for this concert specifically that through the app, that, that option is removed. So if I wanted to sell my ticket to you for 500 bucks and it only costs 50, you're going to have to trust in me that I'm going to send you a screenshot of that ticket and that QR code and that I didn't sell that to five or six other people because you're not getting an actual ticket. Mm -hmm. So it's going to basically hinder the trust in the process of the person buying the ticket to trust this is Joe Schmo is selling me a truthful ticket that when I show up, someone didn't get there before me that he also sold that ticket to and they used it. And now I can't get in, you know, so it, it, it really creates a trust process within it rather than being able to receive an actual tangible ticket. And when you do it through like a StubHub or something, I was say, StubHub you have is... protection. StubHub is going to require when you sell through StubHub, you have to select that you have an actual ticket and you have to transfer like the ticket file when the, t when it's purchased, they're not going to allow you to sell this on StubHub with, a screenshot, a screenshot of your shot. ticket. You have to be able to transfer the actual ticket but for the sale. At the same time, StubHub will also have to limit the price, the asking price on those for to and, prevent the resale. Yeah, if I don't it's a think fifty dollar ticket, and I don't think StubHub will. Dollars. I don't think StubHub will get involved. I don't know. I mean, it would be great if they did, but I think we talked about it before. To them, it's just a business. They don't fucking care. So, it so, really should be up to live nation or the actual ticket vendor mm -hmm. to step in and su set for some sort of like regulation to that point like ticket can't be sold over a certain percentage of face value i mean isn't know? that what scalping was like if i remember being a kid going to yeah. indians games you, you see you, you hear about scalping is illegal two yep. tickets i got two freaking everywhere right now yeah. yeah it's weird that scalping is illegal on a street corner but it's not illegal online, online. Yeah. yeah you know it's like crazy. it's you because i mean technically you, you can't stand outside the venue and off sell your hookers are illegal on a street corner right yeah. so is scalping but online it's not and i partake in both hookers and scalping <laughs> scalping hookers <laughs> <laughs> the button in time the thoughts and comments of jesse Owen do not reflect the made motivate podcast in any way this fucking guy <laughs> We come back from an edit. No. <laughs> um, okay, so so when you and I talked, I believe you said that Andrew McMahon attempted this before. Um, yeah, there's been several artists that have come out and attempted to alleviate the option to do so. And it I mean it's been successful to a point. So what's wrong with it? Why is it imperfect? Because I because there's no way to stop it. I mean, there's no there's really no way 
for me to stop you buying a ticket that I that I already bought and me giving it to you. It's just going to be a matter of making it more difficult and you trusting in the person that you're buying it from that you're actually going to get a ticket that hasn't been sold off to someone else. Um, unless these vendors and merchants truly care about alleviating that resale market, it will never happen. Because mm -hmm. um, like to Dan's point, like StubHub would have to say you can only sell your, I mean, there can maybe be a small increase to cover service fees or whatever like that. So if it's a $50 ticket, maybe the maximum amount you can sell for 70 bucks or something, okay. like a, a percentage over, but they have to limit the excessive amounts of increase in ticket pricing. Um, but to them, it's a business. They're getting a percentage of that. Why would StubHub care? It's going to come down to Ticketmaster, the venue holder, mm -hmm. you know, who is in charge of hosting these shows, putting a stop to it because realistically they're getting or only getting a percentage. Um, and so I have actually experienced this in the last couple of concerts I've bought tickets through live nation on. So previously when you bought a ticket to blossom, it was okay. Lawn seats, 40 bucks. And then your seats within pavilion, just like anywhere else. Like when you buy Cavs tickets, if you say, I want section Whatever. One oh you know, whatever. One oh one row five. Like it's a standard price. Mm -hmm. When I went on to buy the tickets for a couple of the concerts at Blossom, it's ba it it's based on ticket selling. Like those prices continually, you can watch them increase. Yeah. They're doing it based on the demand for them and how quickly you get in line to buy them. Mm -hmm. It should be a set price. That price Dude, should not be fluctuating. Ridiculous. Yeah, they have on release day, you got to get in a queue. Like, okay, so like I bought the used ones and it was like they went on sale at 1030 in the morning. So I like logged into the Live Nation app at 10 o'clock. You get in a queue. Yeah. And then once you get through Which that I queue, hate. I hate then those. you get in line. Yeah. And then you wait and so you wait in a queue line. I fucking hate Until 1030. Mm -hmm. And like the sooner you were in the queue, the better place you then have in line. So you wait in the queue line. Then you wait in the actual line. Yeah. And then once your number is called, then you get access to actually get the ticket. And then you have to scramble to try and figure out what ticket you want because you literally are watching the prices change yeah. as you're trying to pick the tickets you want. There isn't a ticket, uh, a face value ticket. But that's ridiculous. Yeah, you pretty much have to just blindly go at it and just go, I just want that ticket. It never no matter how much it costs. But it historically never yeah. used to be that way. Yeah, it was. I've never run into that at Blossom. It was your lawn is a set price and then each quadrant is a certain price. And it, mm. that's the price you're going to pay. Regardless if you get to it the 50th person or you get to it the first person, now it's like somebody might be able to go to that concert and be front row yeah. for 75 bucks, and someone might be in the very last row and pay 400 because how long it took them to get through the queue line nope. to buy their ticket. No, nope. it, it, it's, it's insane. It kind of feels like a long term version of that for the current one that I'm in with the cure. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's so I filled out information like, you know, telephone number, email, all this. So and they get, said, like, alerted. we'll send you an alert, you know, if tickets are even available. They said, like, they can't yeah. promise that, you know, they'll even be available. So, you know, I, I guess I wait till Friday and see what happens. But if they alert me and I have to get on, I wonder if it's one of those where I'm like, well, I've got. Is it through Ticketmaster? Uh, yes. So yeah. what I would do. So one of the things you can do is because most of them have there's most of the times there's pre-sales mm -hmm. so like friday might be when it's available to the general public but the general public doesn't ever get a chance to buy the tickets because there's three days of pre-sales before that and all the tickets get sold oh, but if you go on the cures website and you sign up for like the cures newsletter or whatever yeah. typically they'll send you out an artist pre-sale code and that will get you access like two days before mm. and you'll go on to live nation and once you go through the queue and then go through the line and then get picked before you can actually look at tickets. You have to enter that code mm -hmm. and then it actually takes you to like the ticket selection. I know there was a code that I entered just to even get into this thing too. And yeah. I was like, Jesus, man, it's, it's gotten ridiculous. I was, man. I was awful. looking at the yellow card tickets and I think the lawn cheapest was like 85. Yep. Actually, no, Five there's no the lawns, the lawn tickets. They weren't up for sale. Are, are they waiting? There's no, no. So really fallout boy. Yeah. The Fallout Boy show, the Yellow Card slash Story of the Year show, the Used and Pierce the Veil show, all three of those are pavilion only. And my understanding so is, weird. well, so my understanding is, so Jacob's Pavilion in Cleveland is where all these bands typically play at. Mm -hmm. I believe Live Nation lost that as a promotion venue for them. Maybe it got taken over by like Front 
front office tickets. There's like another one, another big concert promoter. And I think that their agreement or contract with the venue ended. So normally that's where these shows will be booked at. And because they no longer have that venue on their list, yeah. they started finding dates at Blossom and getting them booked there. And that's why they're only. Oh, so they can only accommodate that many people. Well, they didn't do lawn because you got to think Blossom is a giant venue and compared to Jacob's you can pack it on. They didn't want to put uh, this band at Blossom and yeah. have the whole thing open that actually and there'd sense. be nobody there. Yeah. So they limited it to just the pavilion because they were concerned for the artists. Like it's going to look like there's nobody at the fucking venue. It's yeah. such a larger venue than a Jacob's pavilion. Yeah. So they made it a pavilion only. Yeah. And it limited the, it limited the access. Jacob seems too you small know, for yellow card too. Like that doesn't seem, you know what you, you do with that been around though. I mean, in, for the most part, Ryan went off. Uh, William Ryan Patrick has basically been doing like solo stuff. Yeah. They're coming back for like a reunion thing. I I mean, we believe we're nostalgic and we kind of grew up listening to them. I believe they'd probably fucking sell at Blossom anyways. Yeah. But it just it pro it could even be like an artist agreement venue size based on different cities because of what they believe they're uh, I don't know how it works. But what they should do is fill like the pre-sales, yeah, whatever. Fill that. And then if you have other people and then yeah. 10 days before the show. Or two weeks before the show, open it. open the lawn. open it up for lawn, yeah. and now you can you can start banking more money. Yeah. yeah, and I'm fine with that. Like I understand you have to meet the criteria first, and yeah. the criteria is what do you say? Um, uh, Cleveland. Uh, yeah, wherever that Jacob's place Pavilion. is. Yeah, Jacob's Pavilion. Um, you have to meet that requirement first. Once you filled that, though, man. Hey, let's yeah. fucking get as much money as we can and fucking charge these people. I oh. imagine the artists had some say in it. They mm. probably don't want when you're at that caliber. You've been around that long. You gotta think. Okay, yellow card. It, they've been around for a while. This is 20 years. Used is going on their 20th year plus. Used sells point. like a motherfucker, they though. They do, man. but I mean, I think for, I think they, I would imagine, and I don't have anything to back this, but I would imagine they have some sort of say in like, all right, you're taking us from a venue that normally holds 10,000 to a venue that holds 40,000. We don't want to be like, I, I'm, is using, it a safe I'm, using, hey, I'm using hypothetical. Numbers. Right. I'm just one. I'm trying to understand though. Like but why? Like you want to play as many people as possible. But here's my thing. If I'm a performer and I know like, all right, my, my crowd base, I'm probably realistically looking at like, I'm going to bring 10 or 15,000 and you're going to now transfer me to a venue that holds 40 to 50,000. I don't want to be playing an empty venue. Wow. You know, they, so it's a, an ego. They thing. would, they'd rather have it, have a fully packed to the gills pavilion then a half filled pavilion because people can get half price tickets for the lawn mm -hmm. and there's nobody in there. When you're at that level, you, I imagine they have a say in it. I'd be shocked. if they did. I don't want to pay you $150 for a ticket. I don't blame I'd, you. I'd give Bert a hug and I'd say, dude, have some faith in your product, man. Like seriously. Like, when we just saw them in Florida in uh, November or December, whenever we were just there in Florida, yeah. bro, that beach for the use was. Yeah, they're still big, but man. it wasn't blossom people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they're, it was not blossom people. I mean, there's no way. I don't think that they would sell that out. I imagine that pavilion holds a quite a bit of people. Yeah. I mean, they didn't limit our Google Goo Dolls tickets. Like, I mean, you could get that's and that because Google Goo Dolls is um typically like that's a venue that they would play. Yeah. Like the used yellow current stuff, that's not they would not normally come to Blossom. They would be at a Jacobs Pavilion. Wow. So I I honestly it's gotta be something with agreement within their contract, within venue size. They know what they typically play. And that's why they did a pavilion only situation. Because I mean, if it's cheapest, blossom, you know, they're they're greedy. They fucking take the money. Cheapest mm -hmm. tickets I found for yellow card, eighty nine dollars a piece. That's not bad. Section thirty two, probably very far left hand side. Not bad though. That pavilion's not that big as far as there's not really a bad seat in there, especially the way it's set up. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, think it'd be worth it. You got to see your boy's story of the year. No, I was near the back for uh, Nine Inch Nails, and it was fucking kick ass. Yeah. That's the best concert I ever went to. I never sit pavilion. I when I go to Blossom, I enjoy the lawn. I just like just to be able to like hang out and be outside. Mm -hmm. I've sat pavilion maybe twice. I saw Radiohead like two rows back there. Um, and outside of that, I, maybe one other time. I don't even know. I'm down for lawn. The lawn will still be open. Yeah, but I mean, if you're gonna pay for pavilion, obviously not gonna probably go hang out in the lawn. But yeah. like sure it will be people out there fucking around for sure Se uh, section 13 right up front row p 250 a ticket yikes Jesus, i wouldn't and that's that. see and that's the thing and that that's gone up 
it, there should it should be a set price. Yeah. It really should be a set price. Because well, this isn't even resale. This is directly oh, through. Yeah. I thought that was resale. No, no, no this, this is directly through Ticketmaster. Doesn't make sense. That's what happened with the Taylor Swift. It wasn't the resale. It was that issue was directly through Ticketmaster. Mm. Because they changed their format into like a demand type base rather than a set price. Remember when you used to go to the mall? And you oh, go into like oh, fucking go up JC Sears and go in, yeah. and they, go upstairs, and they pull out the map and like this section is a hundred dollars, yep. and this section is twenty dollars, and it was set amount. I kind of miss those days, although I hated the Two. lines, but like I kind of miss those days. Yeah, dude. Um, other news this week was the the big ceremony, the Oscars, of course, for movie lovers everywhere. Um, obviously, I'm not going to bore you people with the three and a half hour telecast, but there were some big um, stories to talk about that, in my opinion, made this possibly the greatest Oscars of all time. Um, first of all, A24 dominated the main awards. Um, you know, they won the best picture with everything everywhere all at once. They won both the best actor and best actress category with Brendan Fraser from The Whale and um, uh, Michelle Yeoh from Everything Everywhere All at Once. They won the supporting actor and actresses, um, and they won director. So, I mean, they were on a roll. A24 has come a long way from that small yeah. little independent studio, and now it's the studio that every actor or actress wants to work with. Um, besides that, there were some individualized moments that um, really kind of got the attention of some people and even sparked some controversy. Granted, nobody smacked anybody, but that could be a good thing for once. Um, they certainly made light of it with Jimmy Kimmel's monologue. He cracked more than a few jokes at Will Smith, and I thought the monologue was actually pretty solid. Um, I'm usually not one for a comedian to get up there and make jokes, you know, to start off the ceremony. I feel like it prolongs it, um, but I thought Kimmel was on. He, he was on fire, and whoever wrote for him did a really good job, especially in the Will Smith department. Um, besides the winners themselves, though, um, the mo memorial video that they show every year of the deceased um, got some controversy as far as leaving a lot of people out of it. Um, Tom Sizemore was left off of it, which some people could say, well, he died the week of, so they didn't have time to prepare for it. But unfortunately, Tom Sizemore was listed as one of their deceased on the Oscars website. So like, these names that, you know, they're talking about Paul Servino, Charlie Dean, who was actually in an Oscar nominated movie, Triangle of Sadness, which was nominated for Best Picture, not listed anywhere on the memorial video. Yeah, so, see. like, a lot of people are coming out for it. Obviously, Mira Sorvino um, was there for her father, who was not listed. Paul was a, a huge Italian actor. Goodfellas. Um, he was in The Godfather Part 2, I believe it was. Um, Money Talks. He's the cool father, if, if you remember that yeah. movie. Um, but, yeah, Mira Sorvino came out and said, shame at the Oscars for, you know, forgetting their past and, and you know, leaving off some pretty big names out of their ceremony. Yeah, that, that's rough. Yeah, so it's, it means like you can wait a year and then try and make it up at that point. It's like, no, there's always so there's always somebody that gets left off. It usually it's one or two people. But the list was so jarringly big this year that like, I don't understand how the, uh, the mom from a Christmas story, too, was was left off it. Um, Gene Shepard has it. Have they did they come out and make a statement on it as far as the Academy or whoever it is? Did they pass have they said anything as far as why they, they, they basically there? have said that they have tried their hardest, like, like, you know, every year they try to pay respects to the, the visionaries of Hollywood as, as they call it. But, um, you know, there, there's no excuse for what they do. They just offer their condolences and, and try to move on from the whole thing. So is it, yeah, I'm just trying to think Did a lot of those people were there, the ones that were left out who passed away in 2023 the last well in 2022 because it's so there the was last, some the last uh oscars okay 2022 gotcha yeah right. so yeah i mean it's there's really no excuse for it i mean if you're going to honor one especially no offense some of the names on there i mean you've got like microphone technicians and, and stuff like that i'm like i get it they they deserve it too but there's no reason for you to forget like paul servino versus you know a, a microphone tech it, it just it doesn't add up so yeah not yeah. good luck yeah but um, another moment uh, was the Best Supporting Actress category where Jamie Lee Curtis took home her first Oscar after her first nomination. Wow. That's crazy in a career. I mean, you think about Jamie Lee Curtis, you, you think the roles that she's been saddled with aren't exactly Oscar caliber movies that they would consider, um, you know, deserving of academic praise. But like you look at like this is a, a woman who has been an actress since the early 70s. She's she's etched her name out. She finally took home an Oscar. 
and in the process made a rival out of Angela Bassett from Black Panther Wakanda Forever, who was the favorite for the award going into the night. A lot of people had her, myself included, as the winner of that award, thought she gave a better performance than Jamie Lee Curtis in everything, everywhere, all at once. And the video of when Jamie's announced, they announce the name and you've got the other nominees that clap for her. They're really happy for her. And you've got Angela Bassett that's just sitting there with a scowl on her face, just angry. It's like I mean, what Sam Smith just won at whatever the Grammys and everyone chanted yeah. Beyonce. Yeah. Yeah. You can't fucking over yourself. And, and there's no, you can't mistake that. You watch that video and you watch Angela Bassett when she's sitting there and when it's announced, you can't mistake that. She is angry. Has she that. won anything before? She, no. So, so this is her second Oscar nomination. She was nominated for What's Love Got to Do With It in 1993 as Tina Turner. But this was the role a lot of people were saying, like her performance in Wakanda Forever is riveting. I mean, she's the soul of that movie. She lost her her son. She lost her husband in the movie, obviously. And, and it's just this brave black woman that is like standing above uh, you know, the, the Disney universe at the time and, and carrying it on her broad shoulders um, to make up for it. Uh, Michael B. Jordan and Jonathan Majors came out. Obviously, the stars of Creed three came out uh, right away. And Michael B. Jordan said, hey, auntie, we love you. And basically trying to, uh, you know, calm over the, the nerves of some. Um, my personal opinion is Angela Bassett deserves the award more. I wouldn't even have Jamie Lee Curtis as my second best of of that award. Um, to that, I would give it to um, Stephanie Sue, who was also in Everything Everywhere All at Once, nominated for it. I thought she gave a better performance than Jamie Lee Curtis. But I can understand finally wanting to give it to Jamie. You know, it's her first nomination. Why not? it's a feel good story. I thought 95% of the winners were right that night. I thought they picked the right winners. That's one I probably don't agree with. And I don't know if I agree with Angela Bassett's temper tantrum in, in transition, but at the same time, I can understand why you're upset. I get being upset. It's not a good look though. I mean, it's you're, this is um, an award show to like su support your peers and be there in celebration of, you know each other's success in the I, year yeah be upset i mean i i, I don't want to take that away from her i'm sure especially because she, she probably felt that she was deserving of the win as well but there's a time and a place like i think it just makes you look bad when you react a certain way especially when you know that they're gonna fucking pan to you they know that your yeah. your uh response is gonna be fucking blasted everywhere they've got like, five cameras on the nominees at that time yeah i mean i don't know i just be supportive, like congratulate them and be upset in your own time. And, but I, I just don't think it's a good look professionally to, to fucking throw a temper tantrum. And even Brendan you know. Fraser, like that was one of the first things he said in his speech was yep. he called out. Like he, he felt honored to be in, in the, in yep. the consideration with all the other actors that yep. he was up against. And that's, that's another story I wanted to bring up. It's a good transition. I mean, Brendan Fraser finally taking the, the award home. This is the completion of his comeback story as some have called it. He doesn't call it that, but a lot of people do. Um, Brendan Fraser and the whale for anybody that have not seen this movie, it is now available on, on demand. It's available on DVD, Blu-ray, everything else. Definitely check this movie out. It is riveting. He plays a 600 pound man who um, is basically on the last days of his life. And he just tries to make everything right with um, a, a daughter that he's basically been estranged from um, an ex-wife who he cheated on with uh, he becoming a gay, a gay man. So it, it's it's an interesting film and it's very it, it's riveting and it's it's definitely his best performance to date. You see a lot of emotion, a lot of ingenuity from him. Um, it's beautiful. I mean, it, it, in a single word ton of emotion i was kind of getting annoyed with the, the whale puns oh yeah how he, he said, used a lot of them I missed his, it. his co-star hung chow who was nominated for best supporting actress um he said only what do you say only whales can swim at the depths yeah of the talent know. of hung chow or something like that and i was like okay <laughs> his yeah which was a little bit awkward i mean i'm sure he was nervous it's the first oh, time sure. yeah just he seemed very awkward and like the little of clip of it that i saw yeah oh he was big time so like that the open the first words he says when he comes up there he goes so this is what the multiverse looks yeah. like as a joke to everything everywhere all at once yeah. and i was like that was a weird line yeah. that was a line weird delivery okay um, let's see where it goes, but it, it turned into a beautiful moment between that and Ki Hoi Kwan. Um, some know him from the Goonies, some know him from, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, you know, I, or, you know, him today from everything, everywhere, all at once. He won the best supporting actor. Encino man. Yeah. Encino man, man with Brendan Fraser. 
reunited with Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford gave the award away for best picture. Um, what a story this guy has led. I mean, you know, you talk about being estranged from Hollywood for so long. Uh, Kihoi Kwan did not make a, uh, a movie for acting in i believe it was 15 years before yeah. this and this is his first rollback they take a chance on him the daniels as they call him the best uh directors and um it, it strikes it gold man you know he he ends up being the best supporting actor of the year his speech was insane too like i loved it yeah a pure emotion yeah and and, and you can see <laughs> um from goonies i mean he oh yeah talks the same oh, yeah. he's just yeah. is he the uh the booby trap kid yeah he's, yeah uh, God, what is it rate radio or what what is his name no data is data in, in goonies data. data yeah in indiana jones he plays um he's got the baseball head what the fuck's his name though he calls him short 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 stop short something in is what indy calls him as like his nickname but i can't think of what his actual fucking short round yeah is what he calls him but what's his real name in the in the movie i can't remember i can't either right now it was good though but that's what i respect like him and brendan fraser getting up there and you can tell how much they cared and the emotion they carried and it's like respect that you know like they uh, it's been a long time coming time coming for them and they worked very hard to get to where they're at and it's like that's that's what it's all about mm -hmm. you know not being upset because you got outvoted like you got nominated and that's still a really big deal but yeah. that was my question about the whale was like i, I haven't seen it yet Me either i want it um, I've, I've heard great things about it but uh, i didn't know if he won because of his performance in the movie or because of his story yeah you know it was kind of it kind of takes me back to like when um heath ledger he won because he because died because he died and and that was kind of like it was like i mean i think he deserved you know his award yeah uh, heath ledger but there was that question it was like did he get yeah. it just because he died and it, everyone was just kind of like yeah let's yeah. just give it to him or was it because of his act? so it was the one thing i could argue that is the chadwick boseman thing yeah. where, yeah. where chadwick yeah. boseman was not yeah. the best yeah. actor and then lost to anthony hopkins mm -hmm. and they even put it on last it was weird best actor was last that year and, and you're like well it's because chadwick boseman's gonna get the award yeah. and they're gonna make this big last minute ceremony and anthony hopkins wins you're like Okay, what the fuck was the point of that? <laughs> but to Norm's point, and as the only one that has seen it, I mean, do you think, take emotion aside and his backstory and everything aside, do you think that he was deserving of that win? I truly do. I, I think it's not only the best male performance of the year, it's the best performance of the year, in my opinion. It's the the way that he's so tender and he's so vulnerable. And part of the role does feel like it's drenched with, with Brendan Fraser in mind. Like, uh i'm i'm losing it right now the director same guy did black swan and requiem for a dream why am i messing this up very famous actor or director but I, mm -hmm. I can't think of it right now but he said he had brendan fraser in mind and you can certainly see the parallels between them uh brendan fraser was called out for his his weight um in, in hollywood at the start of his comeback story and but it's darren Dar Dar aronofsky yes all right good job um but but yeah, so it, it, it is it's the best performance of the year, in my opinion. I think it's totally worthy of it. Um, could I have seen some other nominees in that category? A lot of people were saying Austin Butler might win as Elvis, um, but it was those two. It was either going to be Austin Butler or him. Oh, OK, so and I would have rather they gave it to. It's one of those Fraser. movies where like I, I don't think I, I've. I don't like being emotional in movies mm -hmm. like to get emotional in movies. And it's one of those movies don't that watch I, it. I don't want to. Um, I don't know how close oh i don't know if i'll be able to uh get with my with my weight your my story weight. is very parallel yeah, yes that's the thing and being and seeing that on screen is is something that i i'm not sure if i'm ready to watch just yet i don't think you'll feel comfortable with it but i mean maybe it maybe if i'm by myself mm -hmm. can't let the kids see dad cry you can yeah. be vulnerable norm it's okay we all <laughs> cry. do it around i us. cry about every movie so i cried at uh last of us episode three oh yeah oh god yeah i just watched that one my yesterday. favorite episode <laughs> it was so good yeah uh by the way i had to look it up because it's bothering me. his name actually is short round in indiana Jones. short round i thought that was just a nickname but uh, that was actually his name was short round. okay yeah yeah he, he's great too i mean he's great in that movie and that film uh, everything ever all at once you don't need me to market yeah. it anymore i i've said it's my favorite movie of the year the film's excellent it does the mcu universe better than the mcu does um so go see it i mean check it out it, it's out everywhere now it's even still in some theaters that, that performance it just it just to me it was bad what the 
the during the the Oscars, the performance that they did with the song and the the hot dog finger. Oh, with a with a David. Um, yeah, David Byrne. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I just thought it it was performed terribly. It's, it's all inside jokes, like everything that's on there. Like the the wiener fingers are are part of a universe that's in that movie. Like they, so, they go through many many different universes. In this universe, we all have hot dog hands. Like they don't say why. It's just part of it. Like in this universe, you have a dog nose or something like that. Uh, it's just the way it is. There's millions of different universes. Yeah, I was just the singing was bad. It was it just annoyed me. Yeah, they didn't win, so. <laughs> <laughs> you got that going for you. They, that went to RRR, an Indian film, which was great. So, what what movie were you, was he in? What's that? The one you said that you highly recommend? Oh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my favorite movie of the year, and it won Best Picture. So, and like what five or six other awards, and it, it won a lot. It won, it won seven, seven. Yes, which was the most since Slumdog Millionaire of two thousand four. Wild. You know who else would have had seven if they had won Best Picture? La La Land would have had seven, but they didn't. But because reason, they fucked up the best picture, Reed and Moonlight actually won. Uh, they had six. Not good. Um, also, the last thing about the Oscars, um, one guy who was not happy to be there was Hugh Grant. Um, he gave a pre-show red carpet um, interview to Ashley Graham. And Ashley was asking him, you know, the basic questions. How does it feel to be in Glass Onion? Um, all this other stuff. And this guy was just cutting her down to size every answer he possibly could. Why? Well, I've only, I was only in the movie for three minutes, so really wasn't in there. Yeah, but isn't it fun to, like, come on and 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 work, you know, at, at that kind of environment, especially with COVID going on? Not really. Not at all. And then the suit. Who are you, who are you wearing? Or what are you wearing tonight? My suit. My, my suit. What yeah. Who's it made by? Me. A tailor. Yeah, it's like oh, I don't remember my tailor's name, and then he and then like they've even said so. There's one answer he gave. Did you hear when he said, uh, "What's the most exciting thing about the Oscars?" And he goes, "Vanity Fair." And I guess Vanity Fair is like um, there's deeper meaning to that. I guess like Vanity Fair in definition means like the the shameless side of Hollywood, like the the spectacle, the the phoniness, all this other shit. So like that's what he meant on not the Vanity Fair after party. And she goes, "Oh, the after party, cool." And he goes, "Hmm." and then like you could tell she ends the interview she does doesn't want anything yeah. more to do with it she's like all right well Hugh, thank you for joining us and everything and he takes the mic down i kid you not takes the mic down he goes oh thanks why even show up if you're gonna be a fucking i, guess, dude, I said don't even show up go. like you're not in an oscar nominated film like right. there, there's don't no reason there. for you to be here just leave well he was he was a, a an award presenter yeah i know it, and then he was good on stage i didn't I know that. so like he, he comes out with andy mcdowell it was a four weddings and a funeral reunion from 1993 it comes out, compliments her for using moisturizer, says he's never used moisturizer in his life, and he basically looks like a scrotum. Scrotum, yeah. I'm like, that's a good line. Like, like that's good. Like, why didn't you fucking use that on the red carpet? Well, I mean, there's people on stage, and there's yeah, people on stage, man. They're a dickhead on the street, but then when you're on camera and the yeah. whole world is watching, you got to get that, you know. That was tough, man. I mean, and I love Hugh Grant. That was a tough interview to watch. I mean, it made me uncomfortable. I was just like, all right, have a nice night, you. Awkward. Yeah. And and Morgan Freeman staring down. <laughs> he got oh, caught. Yeah, I saw that. Did you hear the story about his black glove, too, that he wears to every ceremony? Uh -uh. So I guess he got into a car accident or something um, a few years back, and, like, it paralyzed his hand. So, like, his hand now, there's something with it, like, it's it's oddly, how like, oddly deformed. And, like, he wears a glove in that to kind of hide it. Does a glove, like, restrict? It, so his hand isn't doing i think it makes it look straight just normal like, yeah, yeah exactly has uh, yeah some type of nerve gonna, damage or gonna stir some mashed potatoes yeah and like so he, <laughs> he wears that to every ceremony he has a black glove and weird. Yeah. i've never noticed that yeah um, no, but Mar with him and margot Robbie coming yeah. out he was like he like he lines. he literally just can you blame head. him no no that's the only part I looked at. It I didn't even watch any of the show. I just, when you guys said Margot Robbie, I immediately went to Google. I was like, Margot Robbie Oscars or whatever. I was like, was interested in the show, huh? Fuck yeah, dude. That's my girl. Yeah, he, Um, it's funny that she was there because there was a joke cracked by Jimmy Kimmel earlier about how he goes, the difference between movies and shows are that TV shows can't lose $100 million. Right, Babylon? Where's my Babylon people at right now? And I was like, fuck, is Margot Robbie there? That's a good she joke. Was, Jesus. <laughs> she was probably the only one. Yeah, I think she was. Uh, nobody else showed up. Um, two more things, and then we're going to cut it over to our esteemed guest over here. Last of Us discussion. Um, so obviously, we have one among us that has not seen every episode. 
we are going to restrict this version to non-spoilers. Um, just tell me what you thought, Dan, as far as this season finale went. Forty-six minutes, the shortest it's episode. Short. That, that's the the one thing that I had criticism with was it was it just it, it came and went mm-hmm. like like a lot of us. Yeah, I hopefully you'll be remembered, unlike some. <laughs> To me, it didn't. To me, it didn't leave the impact that I was hoping for. Yeah, at the end, I I, I, I don't play the games, but I don't either. But to me, I I think that it could have been. I was after episode what eight? Was it nine? This is nine. Total? Yep. Yeah, yep. this is nine. After episode eight, I was excited. Ready, like this, this is going to be good. We both agreed that was like the supercharged episode that got you ready for the finale. Yeah, and then and then to me it kind of fell flat I, I still enjoyed overall mm-hmm. the entire series i still it rank it very high but could have could have gotten more out of that i kind of echo the same sentiment so like my feelings about the final episode were that it's i, I can certainly understand why it's 46 minutes because it honestly told the least amount of story between it like so like there are a couple of action sequences in there and really there's one big thing that they're going to tie into next season like there's one big reveal um other than that i was like i kind of thought it was a lackluster final episode i'm I'm certainly not going to say my least favorite of the nine no um but just because it's paced a lot better than than some of the other slower episodes that i feel mess up as i've said before that balance between action and storytelling characterization accordingly enough um but I, I just felt, yeah, I was kind of like you, just underwhelmed by it. I was waiting for something big to happen. Same. And it never came. And um, then it was over. I'm like, oh, the, the post-show interview, like, stories starting to talk. I'm like, what the heck happened to the episode? <laughs> did you watch it, Norm? Yeah. What did you think? Well, I follow the video game. So I knew I knew going into the whole series, basically, I, I knew what was going to happen. I knew how it ended. I knew mm-hmm. how it started, all that stuff. What I enjoyed the most about the whole the season in its entirety is the additional story plots that they gave, um, side smaller characters. side characters in yeah. the game. Like, for instance, in uh, episode three, those characters, the best. like in the in the game, did not have that story. Arc. Mm-hmm. Okay, they created that and they made that bigger. The one guy's in it though, right? Like, yeah, uh, they're in it. He's yeah. just it's just very brief, mm-hmm. but they created. And they did that with so many side characters in the show. So they'd have, you know, they would bring it. So like uh, a little bit further into the season, there's the, 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 the villain kind of, you know, and it's, and it's like in the game, man, he's still like the villain, mm-hmm. like one of the, the, the worst villains that the game can, can uh, uh, possibly see, mm-hmm. which is funny. And, and which gets into my next, uh, I guess, gripe uh, about the show is not enough, of the monsters it's not of zombies it's just not enough i 100 percent. And, and as it got I later never, you know what i mean they affected the as, affected as, plant the plant zombies okay the fungus mushroom zombies and the returns diminish more as yeah. the series goes for like pretty much once you get past episode five you're lucky if you ever see more and than for, a couple for of how here and there. much time and effort that those costume designers and makeup yeah. did practical did, use them use them that's what you know but uh i get it they really wanted to to follow the storyline of the video game, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's one of the few shows slash you know movies in production that follows a video game that's actually good. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of heart behind it for sure. As somebody that hasn't played the games, but I I can understand the imagery behind everything. So like, there's obvious tells that you can tell they focus on. They linger a little longer. Ryan can attest to this. After the first episode, when Depeche Mode plays, they they focus into that that crumbling building off in the distance. You see the thunderstorm, lightning that's lighting it up every few seconds. And that's part of the game. That's part of that imagery. So it's littered casually throughout this whole season everywhere. Another nice touch is that they took the original actors, the original Joel, the original Ellie, and they gave them their own roles in this in this uh series so like the um the real joel shows up in the eighth episode mm-hmm. with your the character you just mentioned the villain um he's kind of his right hand man um and then ellie the original ellie which is played by ashley johnson shows up as a, a very important character in the ninth and final episode and i felt the character they used her as perfect yeah. and, and the way they used casting i never realized how good the ellie in this series was until i saw the original one 
they could be sisters they could be mother daughter for real i mean they could be anything right and and, and like casting was top notch as as i remember my original problem in the first couple of episodes was that i didn't like the girl who played ellie that wore yeah, away that was that was my that was my issue i did not like the uh the actress she, that that played she, ellie at all she almost from the immediate get-go she almost felt too badass to me like and and i don't think that's what the character from what i understand that's not who the character is um the character does have her smart quips every now and then in the games but i feel like they went a little overboard with her representation but she wins me over as the series goes on i did actually enjoy her more uh when they gave her more of the heartfelt storylines obviously there's a romantic interest in episode seven that yeah kind of follows the same fabric of that third episode if even not as good of an episode structurally um from start to finish but um overall in, in my opinion i'm torn like i you know there, there's parts where i'm like i could easily give this series a seven there's parts where i give it an eight i give it a very low eight it, it, it would be for me i would say a b even um eight out of ten um i feel like there's enough there as norm alluded to this is a this is a project with passion. It's littered everywhere. You can tell the guy or team that made this really cared about the property that they were um, uh, representing. And if more projects were like this film shows, I feel like we'd be in great hands. This is the first step forward to video games mattering on screen, whether in the silver or on the tube. Yeah. If only like the Witcher can follow, you know, then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love the Witcher series mm -hmm. on, on Netflix, but um, I've heard you know, mixed. part you know, part parts of the game were in it, and you're like, oh yeah, and then you're like, what the hell? Really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've heard some people really love it, and some people don't like it. And that the people who don't like it are like the hardcore Witcher fans, you know, the ones who like read the graphic novels and the and the books, and the, and they've they played all the games, and they you know that shit. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if, <laughs> I I've only ever played Witcher, um, the Wild Hunt. And uh, so, like his title, the butcher of uh, fucking Blevit, Blevik or Blevin or some shit like that. The title that they give him from like season one, where mm -hmm. he actually like butchers <laughs> like all the fucking people in that town. Uh, you don't even see that in the game, mm -hmm. you know. So that that's a title that you've already acquired once you're in the game. And then when you watch the series, you're like, oh makes sense when you finally see it in in that context ryan you've seen three episodes of this series so far i wanted to get you involved in this conversation what do you think so far i've really enjoyed it um i'm watched part of all all the way through three and then part of four um and i was hooked immediately i mean right off the rip uh i was concerned about starting it because i knew if i if i enjoyed it i was gonna be stuck in a rabbit hole where i'm like i'll be up till six o'clock in the morning watching the fucking show like you do uh i know and um i started it it started like initially slow i didn't because i didn't know much about it but mm -hmm. then like it picks up right away it's told very well visually it's very appealing um i've thoroughly enjoyed it up to this point my question uh, nor are you the only one that's played the game you haven't played the game i have not either of you guys game. so my question for for norm or just in general is i wonder if this is a situation where we're having been familiar with the game can hinder your enjoyment of the show or um, if it has more appeal, much of like um, sometimes if you read a book and then you see the movie, the adaptation is as good and you, you're disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, and because I've heard people that have tower. played the game. What's that? Oh my God. I heard people <laughs> that are familiar with the game. Uh, had things to say about the show that like where they've changed the storyline or they've um, added things to it that they didn't really love. So me having no familiar familiarity with the game, I mean, I've loved it. And I'm wondering if I played the game or knew about it, would it be better? Or would I be disappointed? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I know Jesse loves the game. I mean, yeah. religiously oh, yeah. loves the game. And I know he was really excited for this. And from what I've known, I mean, he hasn't partaken in a lot of our recent talks on, on our group chat, but like, the early episodes he was very happy with it even the things i had a problem with he was right on board with yeah it's not real um well because i know a big one was episode three that was one of the ones where i heard a lot of like grumblings from from that's fans funny. of the game was that you know that wasn't who that character really was and they really changed it i'm one i mean i, I thought it was a fantastic episode it's i think we all agree it's probably one of the best ones yeah i mean i haven't seen many more after it but i'm curious what the character line was game wise that yeah, there wasn't much of it yeah that's, so, that's 
what I was talking about earlier is there isn't that much of a character line in a lot of these side characters that they created and they made they gave them a, a voice and they gave them a story for either of the the two guys in three the like the the survivalist I don't know what you really want to call him or yeah order. that's fair I mean was he a he wasn't a big component in the game either no not or just not, like the secondary party yeah like it's all the stuff that came after when they introduced him to uh when they when they introduce you to yeah. him, all that stuff afterwards, that was just in all game. added up. That was all added shit. Yeah. So and like I said, like playing the game, like I said, if you haven't seen the show and you haven't played the game, watch the show first. Don't yeah. play the game because if really? you play the game, like for instance, like my my brother, my brother has played the game. He has not watched the show. He wants to, yeah. but he's like, he's not worried about spoilers. He doesn't care because he knows how it ends. Yeah. Yeah. It's you're literally watching a show that you've already seen. I see why you'd make that recommendation. So what I heard is is one of the characters actually lives on in the game, right? From episode three. With Ellie, like there's more of a. Well, we can spoil that because Ryan's seen that far. I'm trying to I'm just trying to think of. I the, you're, you're the arms right. guy I think lives like the the guy at the house like the arms he has all the guns all the fucking everything all the weapons he lives on in the game like he obviously or doesn't no. self sacrifice himself I can't remember I can't remember the part in in three where him and his the arms uh, guy it's like a Romeo and Juliet they both agree to like basically kill, you know he kills himself because his boyfriend's dying yeah oh. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Yeah. I would imagine that, that it wouldn't be That's why people were upset because he he yeah. didn't die in the game. Yeah. He lived on and he was more of a a, a role it's model really, or whatever to really Ellie. Attention. But but I I, th I think <laughs> that Did would, you play the game? Yeah, Are so, you sure? I think that right. undercuts the drama of the episode though if he doesn't die and oh, plus what would I he know, do if the, he doesn't die? Like in this established world, I'm talking the show, not the game. Right. He doesn't really have a role outside of this house. So like to me, uh, having him die there, it's poetic. Yeah. Yeah, I think it it adds it adds to the emotion yeah. of the episode and and even That's though it got all of us guys crying. Yeah, he didn't want to live without the other guy. And it's fine. even with it's it beautiful. being one episode, the way that they tell the story in the show, I mean, it's over a numerous amount of years. So yeah. he was there for one part. But I mean, he lived on in that role, yeah. obviously, for a long time. I, I agree. I don't think you necessarily need to bring him much more outside because he wasn't going to leave that place. No, you know, go, he wasn't leaving that without going down dying anyway. Right. So it's like it suited the character building and the backstory and the relationship that he had with Joel. I, and I think they did that. Well, I don't think yeah. that's really. Anything. And I was just saying, no, yeah. Based on the game, like right. so, some people's beef with that's what the I heard show too. is, is that that yeah. wasn't told correctly. And that's with anything the game. though, I feel like you have to, you need some deviation. Yeah. It's like if you, you transition from whatever one source of media to another, like you're going to elaborate further, you know, build off characters. Cause you're, you have to tell, a story whereas in a game i mean it can go so many different directions because you're you're directing what happens yeah you know in the show they have to set a plot point or a story at this point i mean i i really love it uh i'm going to try and get through the rest of them here pretty pretty quickly um and i would definitely look forward to an, another one okay you know? so grades of what you've seen so far of the first three i would i'd at this point give it Probably like a low nine. Low nine. All right. Excellent. Norm. What was the question? What what uh, of the put your phone away? No, uh, sorry. I was actually I was, was actually looking up what you're asking. I could tell he was doing that. Yeah. yeah. I was um, actually was, looking that up. Yeah. Uh, of the whole series, what do you think? One to ten. Ten being the best. For Last of Us, I would say God, yeah. Probably a seven or eight. Seven, eight. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a that's fair. Yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. Dan? I I I was had this conversation with somebody earlier. I pretty solid nine. Nice, uh, pretty solid nine with nice. it. Um, eight point nine seven. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's like the lowest nine possible or the highest eight possible. No, it's it's definitely a nine. Round up for those me. decimals. Even even with that that finale kind of being, I, I think a lot of the other episodes really carried a high score. Yeah, I th I just and and start to finish my I critiques are minimal but like i would just say i wish they they first of all i wish the pacing was better in certain episodes like there's sometimes where i'm barely hanging on there like in episode six and, and five a little bit um 
And, and I wish they balanced the action a little more accordingly with the dr- dramatic storytelling. I wish it was a healthy compromise of both. Do you think, and I'm obviously going to get to it here soon, but like with the finale, do you think that they could have done more like it was too short and there was more they could have done did they leave it off at a good stopping point or it just wasn't enough within that you know as a finale I because mean, i don't sure. know the game i don't i don't really yeah like, i read I, the game so i read what happens in the game i wikipedia both the first and the second yeah. so i kind of i i do know what happens now i've just never played it yeah so it's, i guess like what was your what was your disappointments in it um it's not enough out of it or it's not enough yeah to me i i almost wish like I don't know. They they left that eight up ep- that eighth episode where you're like, man, like I cannot wait for for this. You know, now like we we know where they're heading. Like we we know that the the mission is at hand. Now they just have to travel these miles, and it just abruptly gets they they get there and like it's just done. Yeah. Now now they you know they they meet up with this group, and from there the conflict arises almost out of nowhere. Yeah. Um. They they don't take time like like they do with the other characters. So it was rushed then maybe they could have like. A- drawn it out a little bit longer and given you more to that i feel so and honestly i wouldn't even have been mad with 10 episodes in this whole this whole season and just said like let the ninth episode be where they get there and we we meet these people we come to kind of experience them a little bit and then just you know uh, i yeah because it was quick through it yeah and i i would say like most season finales usually are like 10 15 minutes longer than right longer and this one was 10 to 15 minutes shorter it was weird like because every episode, like the first episode is what, an hour and a half or fucking damn near an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of shows. There's a lot of shows. Like I was griping about this on social media not too long ago about like whatever happened to the days of prison break where we had 22, 23 yeah. episodes and then they bro- dropped it down to like Sons of Anarchy times where it was like a, a solid and like the uh, writer strike man yeah it was like uh, 12 everything. episodes yeah now we're now we're then it was 10 yeah now we're at nine and eight i'm like yeah. hey, one uh series that's six, six. Like, what are we doing? and we're waiting like three years yeah between seasons like now we gotta wait till 2030 for season two of last of us right stranger right. things euphoria i mean we're all gonna be waiting a long time for this shit yeah. you know and, and and after a while we've questioned this on the show several times like you have your hardcore fans, but your typical fans who just like the show, they're not going to stick around for that wait. They're going to say, fuck this. I'm not right. waiting this long. They're like these one-off properties, though, where they're now these shorter series. You know, when it's your, I guess you call them like your sitcoms, where they're going to have fucking 15 seasons. You still have that. You have those where there's fucking tons of episodes. They go on forever. But yeah, it is become a more common thing with these shorter series or smaller properties where i mean even like white lotus i think it was seven and eight yeah eight episodes and eight episodes i mean that seems so short like it's like you'd want to capitalize more on that property you've got people hooked in i would have watched 15 yeah. episodes of that easily mm-hmm. to answer you know? to answer your question honestly i think what they do is they look at a budget that they're going to be assigned to any show and they say instead of stretching it out to like 22 episodes let's put more bang per episode you know and and just condense it like let's have nine episodes instead of 22 and then we can use the uh, two million dollar budget we'll say hypothetically per episode and we can fucking put two million dollars in each episode we wouldn't have been able to do that with 22 episodes yeah so i think that's a lot of it especially with something like last of us i guess i was watching uh i think i was mayor of uh kingstown yeah which is like one of my new favorites and one of the episodes was like 30 minutes long and i was like did yeah. i what the hell is this you yeah know? then you like you go back and it's like most of them around 45 minutes is, is it, it mayor of east town is it the renner show mayor, uh that was kingstown it's Ken- kingstown mayor oh he's talking about there is can't uh oh, are we two different shows yeah, it's two different shows so, so mine's you're a thinking mystery of one with uh Kate Winslet. Kate, yeah, Kate yeah. Winslet which is a good one. I'm waiting it's, for that next episode or next season. It's not. It's Jeremy no? Renner. One and done. Really? Yeah. That's disappointing. Yeah. That's really disappointing because that was a good that was a good episode or a good season. No, I'm yeah. talking about the one with Jeremy Renner. Oh, yeah. the Paramount one. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's I want to see that. One. That one's what becoming one of my favorites, and I'm and I hope they continue because after Jeremy Renner's accident, not really sure uh-huh. what his future is going to be in acting. And, uh, you know, and I don't know how long they're going to wait to um to kind of if they if they're going to recast him or yeah. if he's going to come back and continue to play it because they had just wrapped up season two. They said Paramount has a reality series for him, like his recovery that they're oh, gonna, really? they're going to show it on there. I hope they don't kind of turn it into like a true detective where they recast it 
you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, an anthology kind of, series. Yeah, yeah. True Detective was kind of, they kind of messed that up too. Man, it's it's I could talk for hours on True Detective, <laughs> and I think the first season is the single greatest Absolutely. season yeah. of TV ever. I agree. We talked about we yeah. talked about season one before. And and I like I have the DVDs and anybody that ever wants to get into them, I'm like, please borrow them. Like it is that fucking good. And then you had season two and you're like, oh I don't I don't even think I finished. I'll be honest. It's tough. It's tough. It gets so convoluted. I like season three, but it's definitely not season one. Um, but yeah, it's tough with anthology because you're starting from zero every single season. Like you're getting to meet new characters. You don't have the same ones anymore. I was like uh Mine Hunters. I was really disappointed. Oh that yes. They're not continuing with Mine Hunters. And they left it open too, yeah. and that's the worst part of it. Like they they never finished the series. Like yeah, oh, yeah it's disappointing. What was uh that that police TV show that they completely left off after like I want to say season one. They left it off a huge cliffhanger. You know what I'm talking about? Know. I had the guy that uh played Jim Gordon in Batman. Oh, uh uh sorry, Gotham. That guy and the, and the show Gotham. Oh, Detective Gordon. Oh, uh Benjamin. Um yeah, it, he was in it, but he was a, it was kind of like in his early days of acting. And I didn't see that one. It was a uh season, it was a, a police show, and they left they, they completely canceled it after season one, I believe. That's the worst part. Left it off as a, a huge, huge uh cliffhanger where like one of the lead characters had just gotten shot and was laying there like dying, and then it just cuts Oh, off. they gave it the like, twin peaks, the twin peaks ending. You're like, what's happening? And then you find out that they completely canceled the entire series. Oh, that's the you're worst. Like, what? Sit uh, network TV, the worst. Um, we're gonna end this out with the weekend box office top five and then send it over here to Norm. Um, so the top five this week, we've got two newbies on the countdown this week. Um, you know, three veterans. Long gone are the days of Avatar, the way of water, puss in boots, which I mean was on the top five forever. Um, but now you know, making way for some new films. Um, number five is not one of them, however. Number five is Cocaine Bear, which in its third week is now at $51.7 million, making another 6.2 this week. Cocaine Bear. Anybody here going to see it besides me? Maybe. It's not yeah, I'll see it. Not, not in theaters, though. I think I'll wait yeah. for streaming. I don't think you need to see it in It's theaters. out. It is currently out on Torrent. Is it really? Yeah, oh, it just dropped on Torrent, and I'm still debating on whether or not I want to watch it. <laughs> it's I not going to watch for free. free. <laughs> yeah, it'll definitely be a random like Netflix or whatever Paramount poll whenever it comes out on there. Yeah, I'll probably Southland was the show. By the oh, way. I heard that. Heard of it? Haven't seen it. Yeah, great show. Yeah, it's great. But yeah. Cocaine Bear was at the Oscars. Yeah, it was with Elizabeth Banks, its director, and Elizabeth almost fell on her ass <laughs> fucking coming out there, and she sounded terrible. She the goes, oh, my, 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 my voice. Your voice sounds bad. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's not a new strain of COVID that's going around. Yeah. Yeah. It's Yeah, people are losing their voices. Did you hear about that? Really? Yeah. Is that for real? Yeah, I swear to God. Uh, it's back on the show. <laughs> no, it's funny, because, like, I had gotten sick. Who invited this guy? I got, I got <laughs> sick for, like... Like before my fight, I was like a couple of weeks before my fight and it was just lingering and mm -hmm. it started with like a little sore throat, runny nose. I had a cough for, or I was saying I was eating cough drops like Skittles and I lost my voice for a day. Completely oh sounded God. like an, a 12 year old boy. Hey guys, <laughs> like that shit. Right. Then my wife got sick. Same thing. Lost her voice for a week. Mm -hmm. Found out that it was like poss a possible new like like that the the effect of COVID or something like that and i was like man we probably did get wow oh, Jesus Christ. so so that uh he just did hey guys so we need that at the start of our intros every episode yeah. uh, i won't come into the studio until that's done uh number four this week uh Marvel's darling Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, $7.1 million this week, dropping another 44.3% in its dividends. Um, still just knocking on the door of $200 million, though. So, I mean, it's Jesus. definitely made back its budget uh, two times over. And uh, in four weeks, I mean, it's it's showing that Marvel still has a lot of steam, even if it's not one of their more fond projects by the fans. Um, number three this week is one of those new films that I was alluding to, and I have to say I'm kind of surprised about this one, especially considering the critical reception has not been fond of this movie, and that's 65. Um, it made $12.3 million this week in its first week, um, debuting at just over 3,400 films nationwide. 12.3 uh, is pretty impressive for a science fiction 
pretty much a one man storytelling That's method. The Adam Driver movie. Yeah, it's yeah. Adam Driver and a little girl. Basically, he's... The Last of Us in the woods with dinosaurs. Bro, he's an awkward dude. Terrible. Yeah, it's what? He's so awkward. I was watching an interview with him. That is an awkward <laughs> fucking guy, man. <laughs> yeah, Adam Driver is um, weird. He's not your typical celebrity. That's for sure. Yeah. He's an artist. Yeah. He's an yeah. artist. That, he, he's walking Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's I, I wasn't crazy about 65. I didn't hate it as much as some other people did. Um, it, it to me, it's just missed potential. Um, you see the potential everywhere and the idea, the worlds that it refuses to flush out, um, all this stuff like it, it, they, they just leave the page and it just it becomes this typical mediocre uh, father and daughter movie, even though they're not father and daughter. Yeah. Um, sound familiar? We just talked what? about the last of us. Yeah um number two is creed three this week um it only spent one week at number one on the countdown but it did make another 27.2 million dollars at second place bringing its total to 101.4 million dollars this has already this is currently the second biggest movie of the franchise uh in its earnings right behind creed two and um it's it's definitely gonna beat it i have no there's no question within the next two weeks it'll probably beat that um creed three not my favorite of the franchise certainly the weakest of the trilogy in my opinion but still a movie that's worthwhile to go check it out if you love these characters obviously rocky's not a part of it but if you love adonis creed and you want to see how his arc basically concludes um check it out um and number one this week we all knew it we all called it um but how much is what's impressive and I didn't know this. So obviously it's Scream 6s. Who whispered it? Was it Dan? You? Okay, Ryan alluded to. Um, it's number one. $44.4 million is its biggest opening of the franchise ever. That's wow. surprising. So I had to go back and look at that a little bit. I remember the first Scream being a, I mean, it blew up huge. Like me and my brother went and saw it three times while it was in theaters. Um, it became this cultural phenomenon. Still, as you can see, uh, in effect today through six movies. But I had to look it up and I was like, oh, so that's what happened. The first Scream made $13 million in its first week and it got bigger as the weeks went on. So it kind of did a Titanic thing where like mm -hmm. through word of mouth, through, you know, word of reviews, it got bigger as first the weeks one went in the on. franchise. So people weren't as familiar. Right. So yeah. we had to like kind of build that audience. Whereas now that word of mouth. familiar with it. Yeah. yeah. I and, mean, do you think it's because of the actress from Wednesday is that the reason why because she what she did in Wednesday and then everyone's like oh I really like she her was now. in five right I, yeah she was in five was she in yeah five? I see I wouldn't know because yeah. I don't I don't fuck yeah. those movies but, uh, but to your credit I think yeah. that's a fair point I think it is um star power for sure her and even the other female star Melissa Barrero each have their own Netflix series so like they each have that audience that they can bring right. to it and Scream's already a big property as it is so why not the more the merrier you know yeah. Um, this one was not one that I was crazy about. It was pretty good. It's, it's not, it's not on the upper half of the, the six movie tier. In my opinion, I think there's three movies that I can name that are better than it. Um, but it's not as bad as scream three. Um, there's some fun to be had still, um, in the meta commentary that, you know, breaks the fourth wall continuously this time about the toxic nature of, um, <laughs> you'll like this uh true crime stories on netflix um so they kind of poke fun at that audience um that's fun the reveal is the most predictable reveal in the history of this franchise maybe horror movies as a whole i picked this out in the opening 10 minutes of the movie from a single line of dialogue and i screamed as loud as i could when it fucking got revealed i said i told you so <laughs> and people in my theater were laughing fucking <laughs> knew it um way to ruin it for everybody yelling out in the theater i know silence yourself Gosh. just fucking revealed by then god damn it you get mad at the guy sitting next to you but do you ever have that line of dialogue where you're like oh yeah why is that even in here like that yeah. makes it why do i need to know that right and that's what happened i was like uh i know where this is Give going away. yep i uh, didn't like the reveal even even with it being predictable like i i just the reveal to me doesn't make sense i don't like it <laughs> um but yeah if scream is your thing i recommend you go see it um certainly if you enjoy the core four of the last movie uh the core four of characters yeah check it out what are your favorites one two and five two has always been my favorite yeah so i'm the guy that and apparently my friend dane as i found out we're the guys that say scream two is better than scream one yeah two's good yeah um i would say one is is two second 
and uh scream five is third That's yeah what i figured yeah yeah nice yeah cool beans that's what i would want to check out that and creed i definitely still need to see um hopefully soon and squishy and squishy <laughs> all right that leaves made to motivate as our our show closer this time so the we're sound gonna, bite no we're just gonna go right into it mm-hmm. just do it don't let your dreams be dreams Oh, Yesterday, God. you said tomorrow. So just do I'm it. In the jungle. Make your dreams come true. Just do it. It's only a matter of time before that Chipotle showed up with a vengeance. <laughs> uh, what is going on, y'all? Made to motivate segment, our show name and probably least used segment, not by choice. We just got to get better about finding guests, and that's yep. where you come into play. Come hang out with us. This week, we've got Norm. He's back after three years um so what i kind of figured since you've been on before is we do a quick recap like a quick recap of kind of your story to where you got to today so you know veteran weight loss journey getting into mma but then i really want to focus on you know um the decision to leave mma future of what you've got going on and that sort of thing so why don't we kick it off with just kind of your journey up to getting into mma quickly And then we'll go from there. Well, my journey getting into MMA started before the military, started before my weight gain and weight loss, because I started fighting MMA when I was 18. Okay. So that was fresh out of high school. That was, you know, an early uh, childhood interest um, from watching tough man competitions growing up. And, you know, my stepdad used to rent ufc on vhs you know wow. ufc one yeah. and ufc two the dark days yeah the dark days and that's where i became fans of like you know hoist gracie tank abbott dan severin you know ken shamrock those names david versus and, goliath yeah so you, it's like a almost a 20 year run you know you've had interest in the game or i mean, not, I mean in the fight game not actually like the game but like i remember interest in it you know I remember telling my stepdad i was like i this is what i want to do yeah like, I want to do this when I grow up. And he was like, oh, okay. And I was 18 years old. I entered my first tough man, yeah. you know, and then uh, broke my jaw, broke my nose. You should remember this because that was uh first day we met. You had a broken jaw. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I wanted, I was getting ready to wrestle with the WDF man. And yeah. I couldn't because I had a broken jaw. And I remember you telling uh, Justin, yeah. you're like, God, man, I don't know if this guy's going to work out, man. He's already cancel him when he's supposed to wrestle he can't be getting hurt if he's going to be fighting you know that whole thing and and then you know sometimes <laughs> you just got to prove the owner wrong and and end up being one of the greatest wrestlers we've ever had oh uh, yeah that's that's kind of you no nah, i actually like this i like i miss it man i miss wdf easily top 10 it's easily. one of my big regret regrets um not wrestling that last show you remember at the john's house yeah it's kind of like the reunion show is i was so heavy yeah so big i was so out of shape i was like i just don't feel comfortable getting in there and 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 doing this and i it was one of my big regrets it was scary because we hadn't done it in so long i mean me i hadn't done it in five years at that point so like yeah it's scary right but now getting you know so you went you started off in mma and then you yeah yeah fatness weight loss yes. and then uh and then got back into it because my original you know when i got out of the military originally i was going to go straight back, back. into fighting that yep. was my, my my plan and the gym that i was training at shut down gotcha and i was like oh well i guess i'm not gonna do that and then i started eating mm-hmm. you know i worked on that i got the job on the oil rig and I was gone every two weeks. So I was two week hitches, come home for yep. two weeks, leave for two weeks. And uh, that's, you know, I developed that fast food addiction because I never brought food with me uh, to the rig. So after work, tw- after my 12 hour shift, I go straight to the Arby's nearest fast food joint, the gas station that was selling, you know, chicken and fucking macaroni and cheese and yeah. JoJo's. Your calorie intake is yeah, this I mean, world, it just, man. Yeah. It, it got pretty, it got pretty bad. Mm-hmm. So for somebody at the time that was very inactive, it's insane. Like I, I, I probably should have been dead, but you know, uh, but you're not. And that's a great. We're thing. glad you're not. I have superhero blood. Apparently. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's that'd be pretty surreal if you were and sitting here talking to us. You cast cast you as Superman. 
Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm too short. Uh, you're yeah. better than Chris Pratt. Go you ahead. Said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, if you check out, if you go back uh, to season three, and we can post a link in in the details of this show, and you can kind of find out a little bit more in depth backstory, um, you know, to to Norm's history to get into where he is now. But what you got a comment to say about when the video is going to come? I knew out? Dan was going to. Yeah, I, I, I wanted Dan to say it. So um, I, I didn't say it. I'm not going to say it. But, uh, you know, veteran, someone that went through like a pretty impressive weight loss journey to get to the point where you're at today and and then rejoined, um, you know, between CrossFit and MMA and just the overall um, athlete you become. So but most recently, um, me and Chris got to experience watching you um, fight your your final fight and to announce your retirement. And I kind of wanted to find out from you what went into that process, you know, Leading up to that fight, you know, how do you make that decision? Obviously, that's not something easy. Um, but, you know, what was kind of your thoughts leading up to making that decision, going into that fight, and um, just kind of determining what was next for you as far as that goes? Great question. I had it in my head that, um, you know, going into the fight that this could be potentially my last fight. And uh, I remember talking to a few people, and including my coach, I was like, you know, two things are going to happen tonight. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to win. And that's going to put me on a two fight win streak. Yeah. Um, I've, that's my 14th fight and I'm going to announce that I'm going to go professional, but I wasn't planning on really fighting professional. So in a way I was kind of announcing my retirement from amateur mixed martial arts. I was just going to go pro. Yeah. And then, um, if I did get to the weight class that I wanted to compete at professionally, then I would fight again. But the weight class is welterweight. That is a yeah. damn near impossible weight class for me to get to with the amount of muscle that I have, especially in my legs. So I knew that and it was kind of like an unrealistic goal. So I yeah. knew I was like, eh, I'm probably never going to get there. So this is kind of me shelving it. But at least I can say that I was professional. I can cross that off my bucket list right. or I was going to lose. And that was it. And it was nothing against my opponent. It was an going in there like, Oh, I lost to this guy. Yeah. I'm done. No, it was just, I, don't, I can't go pro off a losing streak and I'm yeah. not willing to go through another fight camp and fight another amateur fight just to get a win, just to go pro. Now, granted, I can go pro in any other state. Ohio is just really weird. Yeah. I can go to Alabama, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan. I can go anywhere else and I can, I can turn professional. So it's what, what's different. Like what's tougher about Ohio than say Alabama. Uh, they just have rules. You have to have nine fights, a winning record. You can't go pro off of a loss. Um, so if I had say four fights, I couldn't, if I was four and oh, as an amateur, right. I still couldn't yeah. turn professional. Um, but you know, in Alabama, I, all I need is one amateur fight yes, Win or lose true. and I can turn pro doesn't matter. So that's, that's kind of like the big thing. The, the problem with uh, doing that is, if you go behind the commissions back and you turn pro in a different state and then you try to come back to Ohio and take a professional fight and you lose, you're going to get suspended in Ohio yeah. for two years Shit. because you went behind their back and, and you did that. So I kind of, I kind of admire that. Maybe I don't know what the right criteria is for how many fights, but I do like the fact that they have some sort of regulation in like, you can't just go pro and anybody can be pro. Like you have to put in the work, go through fights, you know, be at least a decent fighter before you can be recognized as a pro. I think that gives more a respect to, um, you know, to the establishment. And oh, yeah, so I definitely, I mean, I think that's a great thing. Um, obviously it can be hard when, I mean, cause you're a tenured fighter and you have one loss and at that point. It, it puts you in a tough position to determine what do you do next? You right. know? And then so, it used to be in the, I mean, the dark times of mixed martial arts in Ohio back in 2006, 2007. I mean, it was the Wild West here. Uh, <laughs> you, it started with, you didn't have to have, you had one fight. You did one fight and you can go pro. It's mm -hmm. wild. That was a problem. If you were a professional boxer already, then you had to go pro. You couldn't, you had to forfeit an amateur status. Wow. Um, if you won a tough man. So that tough man in 2006 that broke my jaw, and if I would have actually won that that match and I would have accepted the $1,000 prize money, I would have forfeited my amateur status and I wouldn't have been allowed yeah. to fight amateur mixed martial arts. Wow. They later changed that rule because a uh, tough man died. You know, you don't see any tough man competitions in Ohio anymore. It's all yeah. in West Virginia. It's not popular here anymore. Yeah. It died because of that. 
And then wow. then you get fighters like say Stipe, Myosic, Myo Myos, I call him Myosic. Myocic, is it? Myocic. Yeah. Uh he when he started back, he was at it was a five fight. You had to have five fights in Ohio to go pro. Yeah, he got to five fights and nobody wanted to fight him. Yeah, dominating yeah. the scene. No one. They couldn't find him a fight in, in a different country. Yeah. Nobody. They couldn't. They trying to bring guys in from Brazil. Nobody wanted to fight him. Him and Jessica wild. simultaneously yeah. were dominating. And the this scene. was this was amateur wise. Yeah. Could not find an amateur fighter that that would. And they they petitioned the state. They said, "Listen, we have to turn him pro." Yeah. We have to, because they increased it to nine fights. Yeah, and um, like there's just nothing we can do. And and it, there's been tons of uh situations like that where you've had like um, like say Nick Brashear, yeah. who is nine and zero as a super heavyweight amateur. Sorry, I think he's eight and zero. Um, and he petitioned this. He I think he petitioned to finally go pro because yeah. nobody wanted to fight him as he was dominant. And he's still. I mean, he took one pro fight as a super heavyweight. One, he's still undefeated. I've never seen that guy right. lose. Um, so yeah, they, there's regulations. I mean, if to that aspect, I mean, they could kind of they could change it to, like, because I mean, nine does seem like a lot, especially like if you're on a domination streak, you're not going to be able to find an opponent. But maybe make it something where like you have to have at least five wins, and it can't, and you can't go off of a loss. You know, like you can't have five wins and then a loss and then turn whatever it is. You know, so, like I think they could change it up a little bit to give like, the potential for people to be successful and still move forward, but not hinder. Like a nine cool. fight minimum, unless you're you're on a five win streak, right, or something, right? Yeah, because yeah, I mean, yeah, say like nine fights with a winning record is is the yeah. regulation in Ohio as long yeah. as you're not coming off of a loss. And uh, wow. I think nine. I mean, honestly, I think nine's a good number. You get a lot of uh, padded records in mixed martial arts. A lot of guys will yeah. will fight. You know the worst of the worst and different promotions just to get a, a good record and try to get that ranking. And uh, some guys will, will pad the record all the way to nine just so they can go pro as fast as possible. Sure. So yeah. uh, nine, nine's a good number really. It, Cause once you get to that four and oh, five and oh, you know, stage, you're going to start going up against some stiff competition. You're, you can't hide anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where a lot of guys who cherry pick fights and pad their record and, that's where they 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 get exposed. Yeah, and I won't name fighters because that's that I'm not going to do it. I, I, I think that's interesting what you bring up about Ohio though. Something that I didn't know, and, and it kind of makes me realize here that like we kind of have some of the cream of the crop of upcoming MMA fighters. Like compared to other states, um, I'm I'm sure other ones have you know equally or even tougher uh, bylaws as you said, but like for us to be so. Um, you know, above our local competition, like Kentucky and Alabama and places like that, it kind of makes me see that like, there is something special here to where, you know, they would invent these rules or create these rules for a reason. Yeah. It's, it's not just up and coming fighters either. Mm -hmm. Look at the, look at the past, you know, sure. yeah. Yeah. Rich Franklin, Matt Hamill, Matt Brown, Sean Daughtry, you got Mark Coleman, uh, you've got Cody Garbrandt, Cody Garbrandt. Stipe Myosek. We've got, uh, Al Alexa Kamor, Jeff Hughes. I mean, these are guys. Jeff just, Hughes. Wow. We've got we've got guys, and they're I'm, and I'm missing people. Yeah, we're, we're missing. We have Bo Miller that fought for the Contender Series. He's not actually. Did you say Rich team. Franklin? I did say Rich Madigan. Franklin. It's Madigan. Uh, and Ryan Madigan. You know. Uh, which is bring he's actually bringing back extreme kickboxing, which I just hit him up about. Even though I retired from MMA, yeah. I'm not retired from amateur kickboxing. Mm. So. Fighting is in my blood, man. Yeah. Um, I'm always going to find a way to do it. Sign me and John up. Ring side <laughs> table. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. Okay. So, you you kind of knew going into, you know, your final fight that there was, obviously, you you know, you might make that decision to. Um, yeah, I already had my, I had already talked to Jake Digman, the uh, yeah. ring announcer, and yeah. I already told him, like, what, be, like day, I, I seen him at BCM uh, February 4th. Uh, at the Mansfield show, and I told him then, yeah, and my fight wasn't until what the 18th, yeah, yeah, so it, it I already went in knowing that this was going to be my last fight, and I yeah. think I inadvertently put a little too much pressure on myself. It didn't do anything as far as the outcome of the fight, I was just super right. nervous, and my anxiety was kind of up there. And I was, yeah. you know, I was talking to my coach, and I was like, Man, dude, this is it, 
I'll, this I'll, is it. How I'll, do I want to go out? You know, I'll tell you when I knew the gloves taking off is always a symbol in wrestling, MMA, or any any physical sport like that. Like when you take the gloves off like that and you just kind of leave them like that's the yeah. goodbye. I mean, people knew something was up when the yeah. loser of the fight was still in there taking his gloves off, waiting to be interviewed. Yeah. You, you knew something was going on. Yeah. Um, and it's such a disappointing way how that fight went out. You know, I, I felt like I was winning the fight and to take a headbutt and to get a doctor stoppage. And then, then people ask me, it's like, why, why did you, why do you retire? And it's, it's for reasons like that, yeah. that doctor, that same doctor, mm -hmm. he stopped a fight by doctor stoppage first going into the third round in my third fight. Oh, was it third back in 2007 at Nautica for the NAAFS I had a blood hematoma that had sealed my eyes shut. Mm -hmm. And granted, it, that was a good stop. I would say that's solid. Yeah, yeah. that's a good stoppage. Jumping around. Hell, even my uh, dislocated finger, which he stopped, mm -hmm. was a good stoppage. Yeah. This one, bad stoppage. Okay. I told him that after the show, too. I walked up to him, and he was like, you're not getting stitches? I'm like, no, because it was a bad stoppage. Yeah, it's a fucking this doesn't, cut. This, I'm, I'm a bleeder. And, and what got me was that he said that the blood was in my eye, and it wasn't. It was just around the eye. It wasn't in the eye. Yeah professionally that fight never gets stopped mm -hmm. it gives and, and it gives we were we were 11 seconds left in the second round yeah. i would i would have given my coach an opportunity to come in clean me up vaseline yeah. my eyebrow and i would have had one more three minute round yeah, yeah. i would have taken that fight 100 it, it this wasn't mattered. like even uh, if you got dominated in that third round it yeah, wouldn't have i probably i, I would have yeah. most likely still won and to go out that way yeah it, it irritates me but i'm not going to dwell on it yeah. you know and, and and it sucks retiring when i'm I'm the best I've ever been. Yeah. But like, like fighting wise, if, if I was how I am when I was 22, how I am now. Yeah. We, so I would have been, I would have, I would have been so good. So we, I watched obviously the first interview when you came on here three years ago in preparation for this one. And like, one of the things we talk about is you're kind of a cursed fighter in, in, in the expectation that like MMA really blew up and it got more refined. We'll say now as to where like you're a product of you'll say the 2000s era of, of that kind of mma sport so it's almost like you hit the scene too early like yeah. if you hit the scene now whew, the sky's the limit you know yeah but if i was if i was 18 years i mean that's that's a lot of sports mm -hmm. even what what i do now with uh crossfit competitions and and everything like that crossfit was uh became its uh, competitive in like 2009 2008 2009 or, or so and um i mean one uh, some would argue that it's still in its infancy now you know being out for 13 years 13 plus years now and um but the competitors to go to the games and all that stuff they're just younger and younger and younger and mm -hmm. here i am 35 almost 36 years old looking back on man i feel great yeah mentally i feel phenomenal i'm strong i'm in great shape but i am just not capable of keeping up with these kids and it was the same thing with mma it was watching these kids come up during the time where mma was popular yeah you know i i got into it like i had i was introduced by the pro to the promoter by another promoter and um we didn't have social media back then. The first guy that I ever fought, Shad Conley, knew nothing about him. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what he looked like until I weighed in. Do you look at that as a blessing or a curse? Uh, eh, probably. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's a blessing, or would I say it's a curse? If you're one of those guys who sees your opponent, uh, in person and and then just is terrified then yeah it's a curse but um i mean back then in my mentality i was young and arrogant take on anyone yeah i, I didn't care who you were mm -hmm. i mean i called i called out uh quite literally you were going to take a fight with steve yeah <laughs> i, was supposed I mean to fight steve that's Bay. that's yeah. mind-blowing i wouldn't do that in 40 fights yeah. of experience but he was back then he was only two and oh mm -hmm. i was two and oh yeah i was an up-and-coming star yeah who the fuck was this guy who's this guy he He's been out of he's been out of the game for two years. He's in paramedic school. Who is this? I don't know who this guy is. I'll fight him. Glad I didn't. <laughs> mm, yeah. But I did end up calling out, you know, I ended up calling out the 2006 National Amateur yep. Heavyweight Champion, which yep. was the one where I got the uh, hematoma. And we, I mean, 
I could have won that one. I was losing the fight, obviously, but it was going in the last and third uh, final round, and I could have. Mm. I took 182 shots to the head into the body of that fight. Jesus, I was I had a chin like a brick, man. It wasn't until I started getting older where I started to take shots differently. Yeah, yeah. You're supposed you know? to block those. <laughs> and as you're talking about, you're taking these shots when you're arguably at like the worst health of your MMA life. You know, not necessarily outside of the ring, but while you were in MMA, arguably your worst um, physicality then. Uh, when I was younger? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, and I was taking them great. And then when I actually become decent, I, I become good at the sport mm -hmm. or like my, I'm the best fighter that I've ever been at 35. Uh, I take one shot yeah. and I'm getting flash knockouts. I mean, hell, uh, you watch my fight against Sean Denon, mm -hmm. uh, December 3rd. It's on my social media. He yeah. catches me with a beautiful right straight off my left hook, put me right down. But I, I mean, I've never been knocked out. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, like I've never been like stiff yeah. out. Yeah. I've always had those flash knockouts. Um, you got one a great jaw. Had, you have bad eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, oh, I do have a great jaw. I have a great chin, but up here, yeah. like in the temple area and the head. I've taken, like I said, I have a, I have a traumatic brain injury from the military. Um, I've taken, I've had concussions in football. I've had a ton of concussions and I've had um, a TBI in the military. So I want to say that that has contributed mm -hmm. to um, me not being able to take punches as well as I was when I was younger, but it could be age, you know, and but that was a, uh, that is a big reason why I decided to ultimately retire from the sport is my body just can't do this anymore. And I knew that once training stopped being fun, that's when I knew yeah. that I wanted to leave the sport while I still loved it instead of just absolutely despising everything about it. Was it just grueling? Is that what you say by it's not fun? Yeah. I mean, I would grapple. I would grapple with somebody uh, in preparation for a fight. This is what actually true story it happened to me against Sean. Uh, three weeks before my fight, like three or four weeks before the fight, I was grappling, doing some groundwork, and I felt great. Um, went to bed, a hot shower, went to bed, woke up, and I, I threw my back out. Damn. I had no idea how. I just woke up, and I was like, I can't. Like I couldn't lift my legs off the bed. My wife had to help me out of bed. That's completely scary. threw my, uh, my my back out, and it took a we had to take a whole week off of training. Yeah. And I'm in I'm in flight camp, getting ready for this flight. I'm oh, I, that's when I started. I had to get to see a chiropractor. Yeah. Um, I was like trying to find a recommendation for a chiropractor. Um, and and, and two sessions he helped me he definitely helped me out with the uh, with that, and I was able to take shout out Doctor Jim Morganson. <laughs> and I won the fight. It was great, but it was the pain that I was going through. Um. Uh, the tendonitis in my elbows from all the bag work and the thousands of punches that I've had the, my knees, I had to get knee pads because I couldn't, um, I couldn't shoot in for a takedown, like a wrestler for would. the first time you wore knee pads. That was, and, um, but the jaw like that <laughs> <laughs> chiseled and lethal <laughs> and grisly. <laughs> But yeah, when, when it started hurting, man. And, and I had to start focusing more on mobility and, and flexibility and, yeah. and, and I, I was focusing more on that than I was in training. And um I said training training really hurt yeah. and it was really hard on my body. And I knew and I and I did I started not wanting to train. And mm -hmm. that was that was kind of when I knew. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd I'd be like, oh my God, I gotta go to training today. And it was I just didn't want to go. On yeah. a on on a we'll say a local level for now. I've had this conversation with John before. What do you feel is too late to get into the MMA game age wise? To, to just just starting out yeah i mean you you want your first fight you want to get in there and you know you want to see how tough you are compared to some of these other guys how, how old is too old i would say regulation wise first off you're never too old man you could be 50 years old get your ass in that cage and do what you, you know do what you do regulation wise 35 is kind of like that sweet spot in ohio where they start making you jump through a lot of hoops medically i would say 38 40 if you're if you're if you wanted to get into it professionally like if you like say you knew somebody who's like i want to go to the ufc one day yeah. 35's it yeah that's too old yeah. you're not marketable 
Yeah. You're, the UFC is not going to pick you up. I mean, you got to think you in Ohio, you need nine fights. Uh, my first year of amateur MMA when I was 19, I took seven fights that year. That's a lot. Yeah. And that was stupid. That's quite a train. Um, man. So you got to think like if you took three or four fights a year, you're looking at two years of amateur before you can eat. You're 37, almost 38 years old. And then you go pro. And then what? You're going to go on a fucking tear and then you got to get what? Another year? Yeah. Maybe two years to get enough fights, accumulate enough fights with a good record to get on the UFC's radar. And yeah. then when they finally see you, they're going to see you that you're almost 40 years old. Well, that's what that's they're why, not going to market you. That's why I asked at a local level, because to me, being somebody that watches the UFC pretty frequently, mm -hmm. is that like when you see somebody win a fight post 35 years old, it's a pretty remarkable story at any age mm -hmm. or at any weight bracket. Right. Yeah, it's like I said locally. It's you're never too. If you if you have the insurance or you have the money to clear medicals, like you do it. 45 years old, man. I mean, I, I still know guys who's 42, 43. Um of women 41 42 really? that that still try and get out there and fight that's, that's when you hit the logan paul tour <laughs> wow <laughs> that's why like i i thought about trying out for bare knuckle yeah because that's where fighters go to die you know their careers go to die and um you know i was kind of like well maybe i'll do that and then when i realized that i just the amount of issues that i have with my eyes yeah um it just wasn't worth it and going into bare knuckle the amount of um <laughs> i mean i have scars i have a ton of scars on my eyes all other all over the place it, i've had to have reconstructive surgery on my lip to put it back together dude. um i've had i've had so many problems with my eyes i thought i had a torn retina at one, yeah. at one point because i was seeing flashes out of the corner of my eye um, just randomly just watching TV or playing on my computer or something. And it just starts seeing flashes over here. I'm like, what the hell is that? You yeah. know? And so many, so many problems. And what's, what's the story with the current ailment that you're fighting um, with a pinched nerve? Yeah. I, I pinched a nerve in my neck in training. Just uh, I think I was grappling uh, with a guy. The first time I had fought Kyle, I was, training for that and um i landed on top of my head and i heard a crunch in my neck which it sounds bad but honestly it's kind of normal mm -hmm. you know it's a normal injury and getting pinched nerves usually heal on its own in a couple of weeks and you don't really have a problem with it this time it's been almost a year probably a year now wow. and it's still pinched and um, i actually fought this last fight with that problem i i had no power i'm losing strength in my right arm yeah and I remember during the fight trying to uh, create distance to throw an uppercut and I was throwing right hooks and I had nothing on them. Like it felt like it was um, like I had no stamina or I, my yeah. arm was fatigued. Like I just had nothing. That's why you, in the video you, you watch, I'm throwing a lot of lefts, mm -hmm. a lot of left hooks, a lot Very of unorthodox liver shots. for you. Yeah. So. Hmm. Um, let's talk about, so obviously, you know, retirement happened. Um, where does that leave you now as far as, you know, your, your influence on the, the MMA scene? Um, you know, you, you have a lot of dealings with cage thunder, obviously, um, take us through where you see your future lying with that company. Uh, hopefully within the next three years, we're going to be on UFC fight pass. That's the plan. And I know that, um, you know, we started, you know, literally at the bottom with this promotion. At one point, the promotion almost went under. Mm -hmm. They almost just threw it in. The promoter was like, that, this is not worth it anymore. We're not making any money. We're going to lose money. We're it's done. First year's the toughest, right? I mean, I, well, I mean, this, yeah, I think uh, Cage Thunder was a thing back in 2010, 2013 or something like that. And then it became Cage Madness. And then they sold the company once IT came into Ohio and was buying out all local promotions because they were trying to monopolize MMA in Ohio. They failed to do that, but Cage Madness was already bought. So Randy Jarvis Sr., who was a partner with Cage Madness, he went back and, and uh, to Cage Thunder. Cause he didn't, he didn't, he was he didn't sign a non-compete clause with it. So he created cage thunder again. And then when senior retired to Florida, he gave it to a son, Randy jr. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we were, I want to say we were about three or four fights in maybe five fights in. And then 
he was like, we did a show at a Medio and Sons. I actually fought on that, fought Tyree Johnson. I was the co-main event. I wasn't supposed to be the co-main event, but we lost so many fights. We ended up getting down to six for the, for the night. And by state law, you have to offer refunds to everybody in attendance uh, if it drops below eight. Yeah. And uh, he did. He offered refunds to everybody. Luckily, the people who stayed didn't want the refund. They wanted to watch the fights. I ended up was like, I was the fifth fight and that was the co-main. And uh, there was barely anybody there. I was and trying I, to think like I had to be doing something that night. That's like the only local fight of yours that maybe I've ever missed. Yeah, I don't I don't remember hmm. uh, why you weren't there, Chris. Yeah, I don't know. Dick. <laughs> But uh, it was, was uh, it was game. June June 29th, two thousand nineteen. Where were you, where were you it, doing? It was June 29th, twenty nineteen. Well, your theory is defeated because the Suns were fucking awful that year. <laughs> <laughs> He's watching a movie. Well, yeah, but uh, I'm that's I don't know. But no, that they the the promotion almost hung it up after that, and then and honestly, COVID hit, and COVID for the promotion was a blessing. Wow, because it took all the other promotions out. It gave. Randy and them a chance to kind of recover. And then it brought on an entire new wave of fighters, mm-hmm. kids that were graduating from high school, like the Devin Watkins of the world were starting to come up and gyms like apex flight systems and victory who had initially closed their doors and then reopened and got a new location, uh, got a even bigger membership base because of that new wave of fighter that was coming in. So when we officially announced our first show back, I believe in 2021, I think it was September Mm -hmm. of 2021. I mean, we had a stacked card full, full 18 fights, I believe. And, uh, you know, I was just recording. There was no pay-per-view just real basic, no interviews. We're just recording. And, you know, I remember Randy going, yeah, this is basically going to be it for us as far as like what we do. We're <laughs> just a mom and pop promotion. We're not going to get any bigger than this. And then they partnered up with like uh, his cousin Eric came in. And then once they started making money, once the fights, you know, show after show after show. I mean, I think we were I mean, I don't want to like dump out a, a ton of financial information with the promotion. But I think like pre like like pre covid. Mm-hmm four five thousand dollars a show maybe after covid twenty four thousand twenty five thirty thousand wow like numbers just fucking went through the roof so so So, those were the benefits of covid but like take us through your time as a fighter during covid like how hard was it to you know not not only just tested and regulations and stuff like that but audience coming in through the door with so much uncertainty like as a fighter training to fight during COVID? Both. I mean, either or. Um, I didn't I didn't really I didn't fight during COVID. Um, we were Apex Flight Sims, we're actually one of the few gyms that stayed open uh during COVID. You probably shouldn't have, but he didn't really give a fuck. Technically, uh it wasn't considered a business. Yeah. You know, it was more of a private club. So who's gonna know? Well, we had people tell us we shouldn't have been on the air. Fuck them. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> but uh we, I mean, obviously everybody took safety precaution and all that shit, but, um, I mean, yeah, it, like I said, as a promotion, we didn't really, nothing was in discussion. We just thought it was over. Okay. Yeah. You know, there was no, there was never any discussion. And then just one day they're like, Hey guys, we're going to do a show. And we're like, word. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's, let's give it a shot. See what's up. But as a fighter, I mean, you had guys, I mean, cause you had so many gyms closing down. And shutting their doors so with apex i mean we saw so many guys from different gyms that were coming in just to cross train yeah you know and then we had shows we had we had to take fighters in alabama because there was nothing going on in ohio ohio so we were going to alabama for fights mm-hmm. and their covid protocol i mean was a <laughs> joke so i mean they would they would quick swab and you know test but and the second you get across the border that shit don't even exist here yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean Alabama, it's its own country, dude. So no, nah, it's it's just it was a it was a it was a joke. Their their testing protocols was a joke. I mean, they were testing the fighters for COVID to compete, but nobody in that place as a as a spectator wore a mask, was tested, nothing. It was like, what's the fucking point? Like, why are you even testing us? Yeah. 
Well, so. if they're not within six feet for fifteen minutes, if you're you're okay. <laughs> Fucking stupid. <laughs> so, um, Randy brings Cage Thunder back on. You know the map twenty one twenty one. What got you? Because you know I want to. I kind of want to find out you're you're going forward. What got you involved in that? Like, what brought you on? Is there? You know, you kind of helm, you kind of uh, front the media team at this point, or at least the video stuff and, um, you know, the behind the scenes of us being able to watch the fights. Um, what, how, how did you get involved in that aspect of, of the fight scene and uh, well, your relationship there? In 2016, I started my podcast, Rubber City Throwdown. Um, it's no longer a thing now. But jerk off of a co host. <laughs> Chris, Fuck yeah, Chris guy. is actually, uh, my first co-host, man. But um Man, you get around. <laughs> That's what I hear. Now, uh I was interested in media and I reached out to a couple of local promotions at the time and they weren't interested in having us do anything. And I remember we were at a show in Cleveland and my my friend Matt, who was my cameraman for so long, is kind of like my right hand man. Shout and, out to Matt. And uh he looks at me goes bro that's what i want to do i said what he goes and he's pointing to the cameraman i'm like you just want to be a fucking cameraman he goes no, i want to record these shows at the time there was a rumor mill going around that there was a new mma promotion in akron called honor fighting championship and i messaged the promoter and said hey how would you feel about me coming on and doing interviews fighter interviews He's like, yeah, yeah, come on in, you know, get in here. And you know, I'm like, cool. Well, not recording. We're just doing interviews. So, like, we have a back room in the chaparrales with some cell phones mm -hmm. and recorded fighter interviews, mm -hmm. uploaded them to like Google Drive or something. Yeah. That's what we did. Eventually, that turned into uh, taking a leap that I, at the time, wasn't comfortable doing, but I, I'm glad I did. But I took that leap. And I, we, I asked to record and I said, Hey, let me, let me record shows for you. I think I can do this. I taught myself how to edit videos. Um, and then I bought a camera and then we eventually turned that into, it was like cage thunder became a thing after cage madness got bought out. So I talked to Jarvis and I said, Hey man, you guys need a cameraman. And at the time the cameraman that they were using, wasn't giving them their footage. He would record for a hundred bucks and he would just hoard the footage. You know, it wasn't really giving it. It wasn't putting on YouTube. It wasn't, there was no case under a uh, Facebook page or anything like that. There was no what's, social media. What's the point? Exactly. And I think at the time the, uh, it was like, ah, fighters don't want their fights on YouTube because they don't want their opponent studying them, yada, yada, yada. But you're paying somebody to record for you. So you're just you losing want, money. You want it out there. Yeah. Right? So I told him, I said, hey, man, I was like, I'll make you a YouTube channel, a Facebook page. I'll put this shit up on your, on, on you know, I'll, I'll edit the videos. I'll put all the fights up there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, what do you want? I told him my price. Let's do it. So I started doing interviews with the fighters. I was editing all those, like usually around 34 fighter interviews. I'd edit all those. I'd put them all out before the show would even start. We'd record the show. It'd take me about four or five days to record the or, uh, to edit the show. Dump it all on Facebook. Yeah. And um, leading up to now, uh, last year, I went to Rand and said, hey, man, I want to try to create this pay-per-view. You know, there's money here. There's money to be made. I don't know how to do this, but if I figure it out, do you want it to, do you want this to happen? And he said, yes, absolutely. Okay. So <laughs> knowing nothing about no idea, I called past um, video producers that I've worked with that I've, that I've seen before uh, some local legend guys like Mike Moran that used to come through and, and, you know, like a, the old, the old goat, man, that would come through and, and, and record and, and, uh, like all the NAAFS videos. I mean, this guy, yeah. this guy's on the road, like most of the year he records for top end, like professional wrestling mm -hmm. and MMA on UFC fighter pass. I mean, he guy does it all. So I'm, I'm contacting him. I'm trying to figure out like, okay, I've got my, my operating 
system, you know, my broadcast system. I was like, I need to figure out what platform we have. I don't know how to find a platform, how much it's going to cost and where do we go? And then once I stream it, how do I get it behind a paywall? Right. No idea how to do it. I, I know. So maybe it would, use the website. So we got the case on their website. So I became an administrator on the website and I literally <laughs> through the use of YouTube videos, I figured out how to get it. You know, we went through a Vimeo platform, yep. which, you know, we pay for yearly and, and uh, I pay half of it um, every year. And then the promotion pays the other half. And then all the equipment is still my equipment. And then now recently the promotion is willing to invest in additional equipment to make, the pay-per-view better yeah we got on the website we hired another web designer to get on there and work on the website we've got a social media manager that's going to be working on social media so the marketing is there he's like a specialization or a concentration in uh in marketing but uh yeah i just taught myself how to get it up on the fucking page and then on the line yeah on the line with stuff that you were never experienced yeah, I had in no idea how place. to do I, I had no idea yeah. like i i was kind of familiar with like OBS and, and, and stuff like that. I knew how to edit videos, but getting it all out there and, and trusting, you know, the computer that I had to be able to run a stream for four or five hours and not lag or drop frames to not shut down or overheat terrified me. And then after that first show, we actually made a decent amount of money. I actually bought like a brand new uh, gaming laptop that had a yeah. great um, CPU and GPU. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, this laptop is an investment to the promotion. Yeah. It'll pay itself off in like two shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now I use the laptop for the, for the live stream. And even then using that laptop, I was like, is it going to overheat? So yeah. I bought additional fans for the laptop to keep it cool. And uh, it was just, I mean, we always have our problems like our last show, yeah. the website crashed, mm -hmm. which is now why we have, um, you know, we have uh, our web host is now back in the country. He was in Thailand back, you know, in, in February. So we couldn't fix it for an hour and a half because um, there's just too much traffic to the website. People trying to buy the pay-per-view and, um, you know, now we got an additional web designer on and, you know, hopefully, no, we don't have that problem now because this card coming up on April 1st is huge. Yeah. This is a big card. I mean, you got guys like Lucas Mass who sold twenty three thousand dollars in tickets yeah. when they when they had a show in Millersburg. Just him. Is he still a double champion? Uh well, he's a pro now. Okay. So he's this is I actually think this is his third professional fight. Mm -hmm. And uh I believe he's fighting Lite. He's like oh, been man. around the sport for a while. So. I don't know, man. Lucas uh, I uh, I think, Lucas is good. I trained with them. Uh, yeah, so, I, 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 I wouldn't put, I wouldn't bet on anybody against that kid, man. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's Owen two as a pro. Really? Yeah. But he's, he's fought some, I mean, he's some stiff competition. Uh, he got injured in Alabama when he took that fight there, mm -hmm. and um, I think he should have won that one, but he ended up like cracking a sternum or some shit. It was bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really messed up in that fight. But um you know, we we've got some, you know, this is a pro am, so we've got some good fights on this card. And we we've got, you know, there's a lot of people I think that are not gonna be able to make the trip. Yeah. And they're gonna buy this pay per view. You so. won't say it, I will. I can't wait till Kyle Crum loses. <laughs> Does he fight in this one? Yeah. Yeah. He's not fighting this one. He's fighting May twentieth. I thought he was fighting April first. No, the fight was announced for May twentieth. Oh. Whack. Forgive me. I gotta wait longer to see him lose. But he is uh he he is in trouble. I will say that. He, yeah. Uh, if he thinks, like I said, his his last two fights, sorry, his last three fights, two of them were against me, which he won by doctor stoppage, and then the other one was against Dom John, which he got choked out in like the second round. Nasty Nick. So, uh, Nick is if if you didn't think Nick was the real deal, watch his last fight against the collegiate one wrestler, um, division one wrestler, um. Uh, and his last his last fight, I can't remember the dude's name. It was like Chris Draghi, mm -hmm. I think it was his name. Uh, that guy was legit. That guy was good. Mm -hmm. And he I think that was the first guy to give Nick an actual test. Yeah. And Nick beat him. So mm -hmm. Nick's, gonna, Nick's gonna coach him back to the locker room. Nick is gonna be in the UFC one day, I think. Yeah, I'd I'd be right there with you. I agree. Yeah, so I mean I um just as an outsider for a second, because I'm not familiar with 
you yeah, know, you got involved too, fighting that directly as much as I mean, you guys have been around this for a very long time. But I mean, I um was fortunate to get asked to come and you know help out um with the promotion through Norm, and I mean it's impressive, honestly, to see all the work that um you know you put into the production of this, like him, his best friend, his wife. It's everything. yeah, it's really impressive to see, and I, I commended Randy on this actually at the last fight. Um, I was talking to him afterwards, and I'm like. I had I had never been to anything like this until I came and helped out the very first time, just taking pictures. Whenever that was, I mean, maybe last summer or so. Um, and to see all the work that you guys put in, it this isn't just watching some dudes fight in a ring. I mean, it is very well regulated. I mean, the amount of people that you have, their officiants and the doctors, and you know, you got your judges and your ring announcer and all the production crew and everything that goes into it. I mean, it is for a local thing i'm like this is impressive it's yeah. very well done i think it's very respectable I, I think it's super legit that we're fortunate enough to have something like this so close to us because it is very cool to not even just be a part of but to be able to go and watch yeah. I, I i would love to see i mean it's obviously been growing but to, to even do to even get bigger which I don't know how much bigger you can get because that place is fucking filled every time I'm there. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than uh, we'll you, a newer out. venue at some point. You oh, know? No, we'll find out. December 2023, yeah. we're going to the Civic Center. Oh, dope. Okay. Yeah. So See, mark, that's... Your, mark your calendars. Canton? Or, yeah. That's dope. So, yeah. So, I mean, and that's that's going to be the true that's like test. The true test for Cage Thunder. Um, and, yeah. and that's why they scheduled it for the end of the year we have all year to get the equipment yep. all that stuff we everything get kinks out yeah and... get everything uh fine-tuned and market because if we don't sell that place out if we don't yeah. um they're gonna the promoter is gonna lose their ass and uh the promotion is not gonna go anywhere but it's it's gonna yeah. you're gonna take a couple steps back yeah um it hasn't been determined yet i know that there was a recent meeting that took place, but we're potentially looking at Nautica in August, oh, wow. uh, which is a great show. I highly recommend that you, uh, you don't yeah. have <laughs> anything going on because you want to be a cameraman. Yeah. You want to work that event. Yeah. You, you want to be part of that event. I've commentated at Nautica. I've worked at a Nautica show and I fought at a Nautica show. Yeah. And trust me, it's, that's it a, is it's a dope venue. It is so awesome to fight on the on on the river right there, man. The Ohio River right yeah. there that runs through. It's a nice summertime atmosphere. Oh, it's yeah. it's beautiful. And August is always the the month. It's the best it's like time to go time. there. Yeah, it's the best yeah. time to fight. And um, I mean, it's it's so nice. Yeah, it gets yeah. when it gets dark, you got the spotlight on the cage. It's beautiful, man. Well, so sh well, shit, you were talking about Canton Palace Theater or Canton um Civic, Civic Center, sorry. Yeah. And like WWE still runs house shows there. I mean, we're talking the World <laughs> Wrestling Entertainment runs house shows in that yeah. venue. Like yeah. they come around usually twice a year. Yeah, so it's it's really big for the promotion, and that's kind of like the level of um where they're trying to go. They now went from we want to be a mom and pop promotion to we want to be the premier Legit. promotion oh, in Ohio. Yep. Stake yeah. your claim. So I mean it's impressive to see uh fighters come it's not just local. Mm -hmm. I mean they're announcing fighters that are coming from multiple states away and yeah. stuff, you know. I mean so the the name is respected. Um and it's super legit. So I mean for yourself obviously uh goals to to continue to build you know the media team and the pay-per-view and you know bring on additional, you know people to support that um what what does your future look like with that and even outside of that as far as the community um is it something where you're looking to do anything as far as i don't know how it, it's how it's regulated as far as like coaching or training fighters i mean do you do that already do you have any a aspirations to be involved in it outside of you know working the promotion or what's that look like for you i've been asked to come and come and coach um I've never looked at myself as a good teacher. Um, I have a hard time explaining things. Yeah. And I always looked at myself as more of a mentor. I know the politics of this sport, especially yeah. local. I can talk to you for hours about it. Um, and which is one of the big reasons why I had the podcast. And as my fighter analysts, you know, my ability to just kind of, yeah, you know, see it. And, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, that's valuable so being, though. being a mentor to fighters. I mean, I still have guys that message me for cutting weight advice, diet advice, weight loss advice, all that good stuff, yeah. training advice. Hey, what should I do here? I'm trying to get stronger. I'm not trying to bulk. I'm trying to cut while doing this. Right. I still get questions asked like that all the time. And most of my questions are weight loss related because I know a lot about like losing weight. Yeah. And, um, but coaching to me is something that you would do once you are officially done. Yeah. Like I still am trying to do things for sure. I don't have time to sacrifice to go to the gym every single day and mm -hmm. coach people yeah. and especially fighters, ungrateful fucking fighters. Yeah. Cause that's, I mean, that's what we, we have here and I'm not talking about anyone specific. Yeah. I'm just talking about as a whole in general, fighters yeah. are very selfish. They're egotistical. And it's like, if you, I'm going to sacrifice my time away from my family to come in here and make you better yeah. and you're not going to show up or you're not going to listen and you're not going to take this seriously. I mean, you get fighters, you get new fighters every day. Yeah. You get a guy who comes in, I've never lost a street fight in my life. You beat their ass and then they never show up again. Yeah. Yeah. You got guys who will show up religiously for a month or two. And then they, they just disappear all of a sudden, you know, real life gets in the way the appeal or whatever. Yeah. It's just, I'm not willing to do that right now with, yeah. you know, and, and how routine my life is. I just don't want to do it. It's yeah. it's like maybe when I'm like 40, 45 and I'm like officially, like I am done. Yeah. Like there is nothing more that I'm trying to achieve in my life. Um, yeah. Maybe then I'll, I'll go ahead and try my hand at mentoring and coaching and, and stuff like that. And, uh, like my coach said at best, he goes like, Norm is always trying to do something. Yeah. You know, I'm either, yes. I'm either doing MMA, boxing, kickboxing, uh, podcast, police, firefighter, military. One of the first fucking uh, things I told you about Norm. Uh, ever. Again, yeah. Wrestling. I said, wait around a week and he'll be something else yeah, next week. I've, <laughs> I've never, I've, I've always, yeah, CrossFit, Olympic weightlifting, yeah. powerlifting, Quidditch, what the fuck, curling. Yeah. Uh, Quidditch. Fucking. I, I told my wife, uh, you remember the uh, the medieval knights? They were yeah. uh, I, jousting. That's yeah. in Akron. I was like, shit, I could sign up and do it. I'm pretty doing... good at that. What was that one uh, <laughs> curling? What was that fucking one sport you were playing? For Pennsylvania or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, hurling. Yeah. Rubber ducks mascot. Yeah. yeah. Well, my wife shut that shit down. <laughs> I wanted to form an a cappella group. Uh, Big Pentatonix fan, but uh, travel but, the yellow brick road. <laughs> she shut it down. Apparently, I'm not that great of a singer. <laughs> no, I, That's I've cool. always, I've always, I, I've been like that since I was a kid. I yeah. watched a Rocky movie when I was like 12 and I wanted to box all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, it was, it's just how it is. Yeah. Um, you compete. You want yeah, to and that's the thing. I, that's the best way that, to describe it is I'm a competitor and I like to compete and shit. I might, yeah. you know, we're not on a professional level. I'm not in the MLB or the NFL or anything like that. But, you know, you come up to me and go, hey, Norm, you want to play semi-pro football? Yeah, sure. I'll try it out. We'll see yeah. how it goes. I've been playing football since high school, but uh, let's go. <laughs> And, and usually I'm pretty good at th everything that I do. Not, I mean, not everything, but like sports wise, yeah. I'm usually pretty good. Like when I started hurling, I got rookie of the year mm -hmm. and my, you know, and, and, um, and they were like, dude, like, it's insane how you've never even heard of the sport mm -hmm. and you're as good as you are. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I don't know what can you say, man, just naturally fucking athletic. I don't know. I, that's actually a badass he's so good at everything he's the greatest horse player on a clay court that i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> no but it's admirable it, you know and in the sense of i understand the coaching part like i mean it's a lot of work and dedication and you, there's not a lot of return on it for you um but you do have a lot of respect in the community from what i've seen in the short period of time i've been around it and it's not nice. i don't think you realize that yeah that's it's actually surprising to hear that like it really is because yeah. I um one of my biggest fears when retiring from this sport was to fade out of it, just to fade away. Yeah. A lot of guys when they stop fighting, they just nobody ever knows who they are. You know, you get these new fighters that come up after you're done and they have never heard your name. They have no idea who you are. And um, that was my biggest fear was fading out from the scene. And um I'm actually really it's actually really cool that I didn't. Yeah. That I went out the way that I did with the level of popularity that 
I I went out and 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 I went from you know being a virtual unknown, you know, to the politics of MMA back in the early days of 2007 to 2010, where if you won, everyone loved you. If you lost, yeah. everyone hated you. And um, yeah, I still had guys. I, I had a a super fan that uh, he came. To, he's gone to every single MMA event I've ever been to. Really. Um, he was there for my debut. He was there for my last fight and I got a chance to talk to him. And, you know, the fact that he still remembered me was, uh, was real humbling. And I was like, Oh man, that's really cool. You know, it was, it was, it was I was glad even one person, man, that's what it's all about. That's... It's in the way you carry yourself too, though. Like, I mean, like you talked about earlier after the, your most recent fight, like you're very respectful and you, you know, you try and uh, offer advice or gratitude just for the experience, whether you win or lose, like you're very humbling, you know, you, you seem very humble about it. And I think that means a lot more than the people that like they win and they want to be cocky and like a show off or whatever. Like it's cool to be excited or whatever, but like when you show that you genuinely care and you're there for the community and you're there for other fighters that carries things a lot differently. Um, and you're going to be able to offer so much more with that going forward and to make yourself available through the mentoring and stuff like that. I think that that's uh, very important and you're going to, you gain so much more for something like that, like not even monetarily, but to be able to give back and to show what you've been able to do and offer that experience. I think that's, that means so much more than just, you know, anything else yeah. really, you know? So I, mean, I never knew, I, I never thought in a, in a hundred years that, I would where I'd be at in the community right now. I never thought I'd be here. And like I said, I just thought I'd fade. I just fade away. Yeah, that's really what it was. And I think getting involved with the promotions and and doing what I did, and you know, I didn't do it to to be remembered as far as like the media and stuff like yeah. that goes. Um, I wanted to create platforms and I wanted to help fighters. Yeah. Um, yeah. for wanted, the overall good. Yeah. There's too much knowledge with you to let that wither and go to waste. Yeah, that, I never all. wanted the things that I do. I never wanted to do to make money. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to do to give fighters a, a better spotlight, yep. you know, to make them known because when I started fighting, we didn't have that. We didn't have social media. We didn't have podcasting. We Nobody knew who we were unless we were good, unless we were fighting top name guys and yep. we were making a name for ourselves through that. And it's like I said, man, and you know, my MMA career started great. And it, you know, just, you know, you get more fights, start fighting tougher guys, and you kind of get exposed. And yeah. I, like I said, back then there was you know, training. Right. You know, if you knew how to do an arm bar, you were the new jujitsu <laughs> instructor. <laughs> so uh, it just yeah. Kind of how it was back then. I was jumping from team to team, gym to gym, trying to figure out. I was just a brawler back then. I was smoking two packs a day. Yeah. You know, so I said, like, I'm such a better fighter now. And it's 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 a shame that I had to retire yeah. now. Yeah. So, and then I think uh when I was on Forge Forge in Ohio, Jake asked me, he goes, Are you know, you're done fighting, huh? And I was like, Yes and no. Yeah. If I get to a weight class that I feel like I want to compete at. You know, if I happen to just lose a bunch of weight, and I'm like, oh, I can make a run of welterweight. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a fight. I might not tell anybody about it. I might go out of state for it. Yeah. But, oh, see why not? I mean, there are guys that are still fighting in their 40s, you know? So. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yep. Um. All right. Any other any other questions you guys got? I, I don't have a question. I just have an observation. Um. I wanted to bring it up on that last section we were talking about, about, you know, um, humility and just norm being that kind of person that you know he doesn't take credit for himself look the guy you see here before you is one of the most intelligent people for the sport that you are ever going to meet humble for days um you know hardy and dedicated in the ring by nights uh, and as much as you see him here before you when you see him on a mini golf course, it is a completely different person. He is a son of a bitch. He makes tapes when he wins a championship and he rubs it in your face, drinking the nastiest muscle milk ever. I got to, I got to start that sure. up again. I do. Now that I have all like all the equipment, I, I got to make commercials. We got to do that one that we talked about. Yeah, we have to. Oh, have the, to oh, that, we, uh, we have to. Wasn't that for Brad or something? Yeah, we have to do it. I want to make it. It'd be so funny. <laughs> You tell me when. Uh, yeah, I whenever to, you have time. Once it gets a little nicer, I don't want to clip it. Well, like yeah. I said, we'll we'll do it in segments. I don't care if it's yeah. one segment every three months. We got to do it, man. Month away. Yep. 
I want to do that. It's so funny. No, sometimes I just get a random idea. And I'll be like, Jess, record this real quick. I love it. Like, I have it. Like I, like I don't have to study the mo- like the was the monologue, uh, yeah, the shit that I said. I don't have to study it. I just know. I'm That's like, the best this part. Is it. That's the best. This part. is what's gonna. Happen. I'm saying this. Quick wits. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it just comes to me. I love it. All right, good stuff. So yeah, I mean, uh, long story short, check out. Um, you know, the previous episode with Norm, you'll find out more. Check out Cage Thunder. You want to plug it? Well, you. You you do all the promotion. Do you have your own page for the production stuff you do, or it's just a part of? Uh, I mean, we have Rubber City Production, but I yeah. am not active on that at all. Gotcha. Um, that's going to be a page that I'm going to rebrand if I ever do bring back the the podcast. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but uh, no, Cage Thunder. You know, we have April first at the Chaparral's Event Center. Show start at seven p.m. Get your tickets online. Uh, you go to Cage Thunder MMA. Uh dot com that's our website you can buy the tickets there um you could also order the pay-per-view if you can't make it out to the show because tickets are selling fast we have literally sold out every single show that we have had in the last year and a half yeah almost two years so it is there's literally like a line around the building like whenever i show up there it's like I mean, we're, we're literally like shutting the doors on people. Yeah. We, we can't let them in. There are people waiting like they're at a nightclub for people to get done and it's walk wild. out and leave so they can get them in because we're at capacity all the time, which is why they're seeking out bigger venues. Yeah. The next show after that is May 20th, again, at the Chaparral's Event Center. So on uh, this show coming up April 1st is a pro-am. So we've got guys like Lucas Mass, Drew Schottheimer, some local oh, guys. Drew fighting. Yeah. So we we got some we got some good guys that are trying to get on this card. We also have um like an MMA newcomer, Bryce Hargrove, who is uh who played for the Atlanta Falcons, who's uh making his debut at heavyweight, coming down from 320 pounds. Dude's a dude's an animal. He's six foot four. Jesus, Jesus, he was an offensive lineman. Guys, in, in incredibly hard to move. I think I took him down one time in training. And I was hurting. Like they were like, "Oh my god, you took him down!" And I got up and I was like, "Yeah." And I looked over and I said, "I may have won the battle, but I lost this war, dude, because my body is killing me right now." That's a big boy, I mean, man. He just drops his hips and he's impossible to take down. So I'm really excited to see how he kind of translates that over to his NFL experience and MMA. And yeah. and like I said on um another podcast before, it's seeing that. For the first time, you know, you see there's two fighters, man. There's two types of fighters. You see them in training, and then you see them when they fight. And when that door locks for the first time, it's the best feeling in the world watching someone's inner demon come out for the first time. Yeah, They're either going to bitch out and they're going to get their ass beat, or you're going to see a side of somebody that you've never saw before, that you've never expected uh, you know, and, and it's, it's so incredible to watch that, that inner demon come out and that's, you know, you know, the person that you are after that first fight, yeah. you know, you're either a natural born killer, you're a violent, you know, you're, you're a closeted violent person, or you're just a bitch. <laughs> you're going to find it out. So uh, it's exciting they, to watch. Cage Thunder, are they looking to do like one show a month? Like, is that the. Uh, now it's one what every two and a half months. Every yeah, I mean two. they're looking at what April, May, August, October, and then December. I think. Okay. I believe it's October. So. Yeah. They're trying to get more shows. Solid. They're trying to figure it out. Yeah. If they can book it, they'll do it. It's it's hard though because you got to give time for matchmaking. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nice. All right, y'all. So yeah, check out Cage Thunder. Uh, Thank you for coming on and and hanging with us again, Norm, for your for your second uh, episode. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks for you. having me. Missed Absolutely, you. man. I did miss you. Um, on the show the first time. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and we'll miss you at Dan's wedding. All right, y'all. That's all. <laughs> thanks for tuning in, y'all. That is Made to Motivate podcast. Make sure you tune into the show every week. Like, share, subscribe, hit the bell on YouTube so you know when the new videos launch. And check out our pages individually if you can. We appreciate the support. At Jesse Unk SI on Twitter. Chris the Film Freak Kessinger. Check out the Film Freak Review page on Facebook. And I am Ryan Weiss. You can check out rockeverywhereinc.etsy.com to follow my art and apparel page. We appreciate the support. And, of course, at Made to Motivate Podcast on all social media sites. Thanks again, and we'll check you next week. <laughs>